Arun, you ready to go? Uh, yep, I'm ready to go. All right, hello everybody. Uh, so today we are pleased to introduce Arvind Krishnamurthy who will be tell, teaching us about microfinancial modeling of intermediaries. So Arvind prefers uh, to answer questions at certain times, so he'll stop himself and give you an opportunity to ask questions and you can use the raised hand feature to ask questions directly or you can type them into your box, into the chat box. Uh, okay, Arvind, take it away, thanks. Okay. Uh... Uh, thank you guys for having me here and thank you everyone for uh, uh, for listening. So I'm going to talk about um, macro financial modeling of intermediaries and I'm going to approach this really from uh, two sides. The uh, first thing set of things that I want to discuss is uh, how uh, intermediary frictions uh, affects asset pricing. Okay, so if you want that's the finance side of this and I particularly want to clarify a couple of things. One, um, I want to talk about some theory and theoretical underpinnings for how uh, intermediary frictions may affect asset pricing. And I'm doing this in part because um, I have noticed in talking about these topics that there is often some confusion in uh, reconciling how intermediaries can affect asset prices on the one hand, as well as how say a household uh, Euler equation uh, may be useful for thinking about asset pricing. And so I want to try to help clarify that. Um, and the second thing that I really want to highlight as I go through the first part of my talk is to uh, emphasize that when once you understand how intermediation frictions may affect asset pricing, it's very natural that a there's a two-way relationship that emerges between the strength of intermediary balance sheets and asset pricing. And that in particular gives rise to there are these nonlinearities and spirals where asset prices fall, they weaken intermediary balance sheets and so on. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try to highlight that as well. Okay, so the, the first part of my talk to a large extent is, <clears throat> as I said, connecting intermediary balance sheets to uh, asset pricing. Uh, the second part of uh, today's talk will be trying to make those connections uh, to quantities, to, so to macro, and uh, using the same type of model to think about how intermediary frictions can uh, explain or uh, uh, help understand uh, financial crises. And I'll break that part of the talk into uh, two pieces. One, I want to go over some facts about the crisis cycle. Um, there's been a large literature um, over the last 20 years um, a lot of it spurred by the global financial crisis, basically collecting historical data on uh, financial crisis. And we have fairly well-established patterns of what a crisis looks like. Uh, and when I mean patterns, I be, both mean qualitative patterns as well as quantitative patterns. And I'm gonna take um, a frictional intermediation model and try to use it to match uh, those facts. And uh, hopefully in that process, uh, illuminate uh, what's useful and what's not useful and and how to think about crises. Okay, so that's basically the plan. Uh, so as I said, I'm going to start off by uh, talking about intermediary balance sheets. And to do that, um, I'm going to just run you through some theory. And actually, I have some empirics here that I also uh, want to go through. All right, so I'd say, uh, you know, uh, put on your seatbelts and listen to some modeling here for the next uh, uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, okay? So uh, here's the model. You want to think about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write down a very simple model that starts with first principles. And the reason I'm starting with a simple first principles model is just to make, make it clear kind of what's on the table um, with an intermediation friction. And this is not a model that I'm gonna calibrate or take the data, but I hope hopefully it'll elucidate uh, uh, what's at stake here. Okay, so uh, here's the model. It's uh, a two date model. There's uh, date one and there's date two. There's uh, two sets of agents that you want to think about for this model. Um, there's uh, a set of unsophisticated households. So think of them as um, say investors broadly who um, uh, who don't understand asset markets that well, 
uh, but have some wealth that they want to invest. And there's a set of uh, sophisticated managers uh, who run uh, financial intermediaries, right? So uh, the simplest example you want to think about is say uh, a hedge fund manager, but you can think about a broad sect of, um, of agents who have the sophistication to understand financial markets and asset trading um, who might be sitting in financial intermediaries. So later I'm gonna add some sophisticated households who can directly go out and invest in assets, but let's keep that aside for, for now. Okay, so for now, just two sets of agents, unsophisticated households and sophisticated managers. So I'm gonna say that there's an intermediate asset. Uh, and what I mean by intermediate asset is exactly an asset that say the unsophisticated households by themselves would not be able to purchase. They would find this too complicated and, and not, don't have enough know-how to purchase. So think of say, credit card asset-backed securities, but who the sophisticated managers know how to invest in and value in uh, and things like that, okay? Um, so what that's gonna potentially give rise to is an intermediation relationship in which the unsophisticated households will give some funds to the sophisticated managers who'll then go out and uh, purchase the credit card ABS uh, on their behalf and then pass on the returns back to the unsophisticated households, all right? So, I'm going to assume that the asset market can only be held by the intermediaries, not directly by the household. So the asset market is segmented. Uh, as I uh, said earlier, um, that's probably, um, or that's certainly uh, a simplification of the world. And at least one thing that one might want to add, and I'll, we'll add this in later, is some households who can sort of bypass the intermediaries, sophisticated households who can also invest in the asset market. Okay, but for now, let's keep the uh, households and the, the sophisticated managers uh, separate. All right, what's the asset? Uh, the asset has a payoff at date two. So investors buy the asset at date one, the asset pays off at date two. The payoff at date two is either RH or it's RL. So it's a, this is just a simple two point process. And the probabilities of the payoff are either uh, fee or one minus fee. So fee is the probability of the good payoff. One minus fee is the probability of the bad payoff. And we're gonna be solving for the asset price at date one P. Right. So uh, as I said, the uh, unsophisticated households will potentially give some money to the sophisticated managers who will then take the money and uh, buy uh, some of this asset. And there's a market clearing condition that will determine this asset price at date 1P. Uh, there's a unit measure of intermediaries. Uh, they're run by these managers. Each manager uh, has his own wealth that he's going to bring to the table. And his own wealth is little w. Uh, the uh, intermediaries are all identical, so we can. Well, I'm going to also talk about aggregate capital or aggregate wealth of the intermediary sector, which is capital W, right? And that's going to be important in um, uh, in the equilibrium. Uh, households have a large endowment, so they're they're going to not be constrained in how much money they want to give to the intermediaries. Everyone's risk neutral, uh, and there's no discounting. Okay, so that is to say that the uh, riskless rate here is uh, is zero. All right, so the heart of uh, what I want to introduce into this model is a some type of contracting friction. So in, in, um, in this world, there's some gains from trade. That is the uh, unsophisticated households will want to trade with the sophisticated households, these managers, give them some money to buy the credit card ABS and uh, hopefully share in some of those returns, okay? Um, I'm going to place a, uh, a contracting friction that um, puts some sand in the gears in this relationship. And uh, as you'll see, this basically means that this contracting friction gives rise to a breakdown of uh, the corporate finance Modigliani Miller um, uh, theorem. And in a sense, that's the heart of thinking about how intermediary frictions uh, may end up affecting asset prices. We need to break Modigliani Miller in some way. So here's the, uh, here's the way we're going to introduce contract and friction. So the managers borrow from households, uh, purchases uh, Q units of the asset. Uh, the contract specifies uh, payments from the households to the managers, right? So uh, you write a contract between the household and the manager. The, the contract says, I have to uh, pay some funds over to the manager and in return, I'll get some funds back. So abstractly, the contract is going to specify a triple T, XH, and XL. T is the initial payment from the 
household to the manager. XH is the payment back from the manager to the household. XL is the payment back from the manager to the household. XH and XL are the payments in the high state and the low state. So those are the states in which you either get the high payoff RH or the low payoff RL. Right, and all of these are normalized as per unit of asset purchased. Right, so in, in uh, another way of saying that is TQ, uh, where Q is the amount of asset purchased by the manager times T is how much money the households give to the manager at date one. And X omega Q is a state contingent payment from the household, uh, sorry, to the household at date two. All right, so with that, um, the budget constraint at date zero for the manager is he has his own wealth W, and then he raises from the, the household uh, T times Q. So he has W plus TQ, and that's uh, needed to purchase uh, the asset. So W plus TQ is the total budget that the, um, the manager raises. QP is the uh, uh, expenditure on buying this uh, credit card ABS. And so your the budget constraint is you need to have enough money to uh, buy your uh, asset. All right, so uh, why is the contract written? Well, the contract is written because there's potentially some moral hazard. Um, so in particular, the simplest version of moral hazard that we're gonna introduce here is the manager may mismanage the investment um, and or trade in some uh, way that uh, dissipates uh, some of the profits you know, maybe make some tried side trades with a preferred uh, broker, whereby you get you you lose some money, uh, or don't spend enough money trying to figure out what is the good good asset and what's not a good investment. Uh, so the manager may mismanage the investment. If you mismanage the investment, uh, returns are going to be lower. All right. So in particular, the mismanagement lowers fee, and remember, fee is the payoff of the the high state of the asset, so RH. So it lowers uh, the probability of the high return from uh, phi to phi minus delta, right? So it, it lowers the expected return on the asset um, and uh, management that is kind of making an effort to do things properly is costly and utility units, it's, uh, it costs kappa Q. Kappa is the per asset cost of uh, making this investment. Right. We're going to assume that uh, mismanagement is always socially wasteful. Um, so you don't really want to give money to a manager who's going to actively mismanage. Um, and you want to write a contract to avoid this. Right. So that's the basic setup. I'm ne next going to kind of go through and solve for an optimal contract um, and then uh, solve for an equilibrium. But I'm actually going to pause right now and just see if there's any questions on the setup that I've gone through. Uh, so I, I just have a quick question about your definition of socially wasteful. So um, mm -hmm. because the households are unsophisticated, they don't have access to the ABS market in the first place, right? So yeah. even if they could get access to the ABS market, but at a reduced um, management efficiency, wouldn't that be more optimal than not having access? Yeah. To so, so what I mean as in what's written in the bottom of the slide is I'm going to assume that the households could invest themselves, but if they do, then the high payoff is fee minus delta. Oh, okay, I, I see. So they have access to the markets, but at a much reduced efficiency. At a reduced efficiency. So they're as good as a mismanaging um, manager. I see. Thank you very much. All right. Arvin, okay. Arvin yeah. real quick. Um, I, ha I have a feeling you're going to use this um, fee for aggregate risk later on. So how do you think about moral hazard with respect to something that I'm guessing is going to be aggregate risk later? Yeah, so I want to think of fee as sort of uh, fixed at this point, and the moral hazard um, is is lowering specter returns in the sense that some of some good payoffs are going to be dissipated. Um, aggregate risk can come in a bunch of different places. Uh, aggregate risk could could show up in this model, uh, for example, through a change in kappa, through an increase in moral hazard. Right, as I'll, I'll roll you back to a date zero in a little while, in which you might think that a date one something could happen in the asset market. Among the things that could happen are, say, moral hazard rises, in which case intermediation frictions uh, worsen, or it could be that uh, payoffs are reduced. So, for example, uh, 
RH or RL are reduced uh, or uh, phi is reduced. That's all isomorphic. So I'm, I want to think about those as kind of two separate things. There's aggregate risk, which could be kappa, could be expected returns. Uh, and then there's moral hazard, which always lowers expected returns a bit. But uh, uh, in the model I'm gonna walk you through, I'm gonna solve kind of a static model between date one and date two. And I'm gonna sort of talk through a compared to static as to what might happen if you were to introduce aggregate risk at date one. Okay, so if there's uh, no other questions in the setup, let me just move to doing two things. One is solving for the optimal contract and then uh, clearing the asset market, all right? So um, as I said, uh, having a contract with the manager that is, uh, that has the manager uh, dissipating um, or not um, uh, making the, uh, the effort is socially wasteful. So we need to implement kind of good management. How do we do that? Well, you have to choose XH and XL so that the manager is incentivized to put in effort. And so this, this top line here, and unfortunately my iPad pen is for some reason not working right now, or I would be writing on this. Um, is the uh, IC constraint. So on the left side here is the payoff to the manager if he manages, right? So kappa there is the cost. Uh, everything on the left there is the expected payoff to the manager, RH minus XH is, RH is the total payoff on the asset, XH is the payment to the, um, uh, to the investor. So RH minus XH is the, the final payoff to the manager after uh, paying back the investor, RL minus XL is the final payoff to the manager after paying off the investor in the low state. So that term on the left side is the expected return to the manager if he puts in effort, net of the cost of putting in effort, which is kappa. And that has to be bigger than if the manager mismanages, that is, he doesn't uh, pay the cost kappa, but instead uh, dissipates uh, returns so that the probabilities fall from phi to phi minus delta. Okay, and so you'll notice on the on the right hand side, there's no kappa, and the probabilities are adjusted from phi to uh, phi minus delta. So the IC constraint is that the left side has to be bigger than the right side. The incentive for the manager to put an effort is bigger than the incentive for the manager to to not do so. You can cancel out a bunch of stuff uh, and rewrite. Um, and if you rewrite the the critical thing is that uh, delta, which is the, the, the marginal shift in probabilities if the manager puts in effort, times the difference in the payoffs between the high state and the low state to the manager, which is RH minus XH minus RL minus XL, has to be bigger than or equal to kappa. And if you just stare at that, um, you'll see that the, uh, the difference in the payoff is effectively the incentive for the manager to put an effort, right? So if the manager puts an effort, he increases the probability of the high state from phi minus delta to phi. So in order for the manager to put an effort, his um, marginal increase in returns, that is to, to increase his payoff from RL minus XL to RH minus XH, that's the marginal increase in returns if he puts in some effort, times delta has to be bigger than or equal to kappa. I saw there was a question on the chat, which is, is uh, effort observable? And the answer is no, this is a moral hazard problem. So in a classic moral hazard problem, uh, there's some unobserved effort and that's exactly what's going on here. So all the investor can do is give some money to the manager. It's the manager then kind of shuffles it around as uh, he or she, see fit, she sees, sees fit. And among those actions that the manager could take is sort of mismanaged stuff so that uh, returns are lower. Okay, so that's the IC constraint. The household break-even constraint is just that the uh, payoff to the household, uh, which is uh, expected value of this XH and XL, which is the net return back to the household, has to be equal to T, uh, which is the amount of money that the household is putting in to the, um, uh, to the intermediary. Okay, so that's just, if I give some money in, I gotta get money back at least to cover my, uh, my outside option. All right, so the, this contract um, has a very simple solution, 
Um, it's everyone, and it's because everyone here is has linear preferences. What you'll want to do is uh, set a contract that maximizes the incentives for the manager to work. Right. And again, just think intuitively, if the manager puts an effort, what is he doing? He's increasing the payoff of the high state. Uh, sorry, increasing the probability of the high state and lowering the probability of the, of the low state. So in order to get him to put an effort, what you want to do is um, maximize the payoff to him in the high state and minimize the payoff to him in the low state. That creates as much of an incentive for him to put an effort. Right. By marginally putting an effort, he shifts payoffs from the low state to the high state. And so you want to kind of maximize that difference so that um, he puts an effort. So set XL as high as possible. Basically, give him no payoff in the low state. Set it equal to RL. Um, since that strictly relaxes the IC. And then you can choose XH to compensate. Right. You ideally want to set XH as low as possible and XL as, as high as possible. Uh, you definitely want to set XL as high as possible. If you set XL as high as possible and rewrite, then the uh, IC constraint becomes uh, XH is less than or equal to RH minus cap over delta. All right, RH is the, high is the payoff in the high state. Um, and kind of one way of thinking about this is you need to give the manager kind of a carrot in order to, uh, to make in the effort. And the carrot is if things work out, you get, you get some money. Uh, how much money do you get? Well. You get you get at least kappa minus delta. And that gives you an incentive to put in the effort. Since you got to give the manager a carrot in the high state, that means that there's less money that can be given to the outside investor, and so that places a sort of a maximum amount of money that can be promised to the outside investor. And that's exactly what this IC constraint says. It says XH is less than or equal to RH minus kappa over delta. All right. So we have a contract in which the investor gives to the manager T at time zero. In the low state, the manager just returns all the money back to the investor. In the high state, the um, investor gets some money back, but not all of the returns of the investment. Um, and in, in, in particular, you got to keep some money back for the manager uh, in order for him to be incentivized to uh, put an effort. He gets paid off more in the high state in, in order to give him an, uh, give him an incentive to uh, put an effort. All right, um, I'm going to just uh, walk you through an interpretation of this contract that I've written down uh, in ways that I think are fairly natural. And then I'll, I'll also uh, pause and uh, give you guys a chance to ask me any questions about this. All right, so um, I think this contract that we've written down has a very natural interpretation. So uh, the amount of assets that the manager buys is QP. All right, so that's the asset side of the portfolio. Um, the manager has to pay back some money to his outside investors. You can kind of think of that uh, payoff as coming in, in, in two forms. One is in the low state, the, the, um, the uh, manager's intermediary always pays back investors, right? So remember the low state is gonna pay back the, the, the full amount RL. So you can almost think of it as the manager raises some riskless debt. Right, and he always pays back RL, both in the low state and the high state. So from one set of investors, say he raises some riskless debt uh, of amount QRL. And then in the high state, he basically divvies up the cash flow, uh, which is RH into two pieces. Uh, one, which is a payoff back to the manager himself. That's the the QRH minus XH piece. And the other is a payoff to the outside investor, uh, which is the QXH minus RL. That looks like equity, right? In the sense that this is a payoff that happens if returns are high. Um, and so you can think about this contract as uh, the manager puts some equity into the fund, uh, raises some outside equity as well, that if you want to form sort of the capital of the fund, he then raises some debt, uh, QRL. Collectively, that's the amount of resources that the, the fund manager has. And then he takes those, those funds and buys assets. All right, taking uh, one more step on this, uh, P minus RL is like the haircut on the repo loan. So you raise at least QRL of riskless debt. Uh, 
So the gap between P minus RL is, is effectively kind of the haircut. Uh, assets could fall in value. The lowest they could fall in value is to RL from initial price P. Uh, so I, an investor who wants to buy riskless debt will be willing to provide at least um, RL of funds per unit of asset Q. So effectively P minus RL is like the haircut on a repo loan. Um, and the, there's these, uh, the payoff in the high state, which is effectively an equity claim, is shared between the manager and the outside investor. And now if you think about the IC constraint that I, I, we wrote down before, the IC constraint really places a limit on this uh, sharing of outside equity between um, the manager and the, uh, and the outside investor. And in particular, remember you have to give the manager enough of a stake in the fund so that he puts in effort. If you give the manager enough of a stake, uh, and I, let's call the stake gamma, that means that you can only raise one minus gamma from the outside investors, right? So another way of saying that is in order for the manager to work, he needs to uh, put in enough money to buy an inside stake. And as soon as he buys an inside stake, the outside investor will, will, is willing to put some money in to invest, co-invest with the manager. But if the outside investor co puts in too much outside money, then the manager's inside stake is effectively diluted and his incentive at that point is to sort of act socially wasteful. So you can't get too much outside equity, otherwise the manager's inside stake is diluted and his incentive uh, constraint is, uh, is then violated, right? So the heart of the incentive constraint is the manager puts in some money and the outside investor adds more money, but he adds more money in proportion to how much money that the manager puts in. All right, so uh, let me pause here and see if there's any questions on this interpretation. Arvind, was there something that guaranteed that XH is bigger than RL? I'm just want to make sure. Uh, because it's a linear contract, um, the solution will have RL uh, be, sorry, XL be equal to RL. Yeah. Um, and then XH is the payoff in the high state. Uh, you can You can obviously set XH equal to uh, XL, which is the minimum payoff in the low state. And so you'll weekly set it above. And the, the inside equity and the outside equity here can have pretty different payoffs. Should we think of them as like bonuses or like how? Yeah, you, you can think of this in different ways. You can think of inside equity can, can be thought of as a, as kind of a 20% a upside, like in a kind of an incentive contract. You can, that's one way to think about this. You get a, you get part of the payoff of the upside. Uh, you can also think about this as really co-investment. <clears throat> you, you, you ask the manager to put some of his own wealth in to buy some of the equity of the fund, which then pays off if returns are good. Um, I, I'm going to favor that interpretation. I'm going to favor the interpretation of the manager puts in some capital and gets a portion of the payoff, and then the outside investors get a portion of the payoff. Uh, but you can also think of this as some type of kind of bonus compensation scheme or some type of option payoff that the manager gets as part of his... Uh, uh, his incentive contract. Uh, at this level, I think the, the model is um, not sufficiently detailed to be able to separate those two things. All right. Um, I guess the, the takeaway I want you from, from this from the slide is to just uh, sort of come back and think, oh, this, this primitive contract can be thought about as raising riskless debt and inside and outside equity. And the important thing that the underlying corporate finance friction places is a limit on how much outside equity you can raise as a function of how much inside equity the manager puts in. All right, so here's uh, then the asset market clearing. Um, let me suppose for now that there's some capital theta units of the asset. The asset market clearing condition is, uh, remember, We've segmented the asset market, assumed only the uh, manager can buy the asset. Um, so uh, the asset market clearing condition is Q equals capital theta. Uh, the manager has to buy all of the asset in equilibrium. The uh, clearing condition then can just be rewritten in terms of the budget constraint. So the manager gets has capital W across the entire intermediary sector plus Q times T, which is the total amount of funds that the intermediary sector raises from the uh, outside investors. Um, 
that divided by P, P has to equal Q, right? So your total amount of money uh, has to be used to buy all of the asset. You can rewrite that so that kind of just rewrites uh, capital P as a function of both the amount of inside capital W of the managers, as well as the amount of financing raised T theta. Um, uh, I'm gonna focus on an equilibrium in which the manager raises as much money as possible from outside investors. So he'll saturate uh, uh, all of the incentive constraints. And if you do so, then the total amount of money you can raise from the, from the outside investors is equal to the expected return E of R um, minus the amount of uh, payoff you have to give to the manager in order to get him to work. Right? You can't promise the manager all of the money. And this is if you want the key uh, of the contracting friction because then he won't put an effort. You gotta keep a little bit of a side to pay the manager. Uh, so the maximum amount of money that the outside investor will ever willing to pay is expect return minus how much of an inside stake you have to give the manager. So T equal E of R minus fee cap over Delta. If you take that, plug that into the uh, asset pricing equation, you get this nice result uh, down here. Um, which I find kind of an attractive way of thinking about the asset price in this uh, frictional contracting world, right? So um, the asset price is the expected return of the asset. So E of um, basically RHRL. And then there's two adjustments you have to make. One is uh, linked to the moral hazard friction in this model, right? So the moral hazard friction shows up as effectively a limit on how much financing you can raise. And for example, uh, and this is a discussion Alexi, you and I had earlier, if uh, there's a state of the world in which moral hazard concerns are, are wider, what that will mean is that the contracting frictions tighten, outside investors will put less money in to uh, these funds. As a result, the funds will have less money to go out and buy assets. That's gonna reduce demand for the asset and so in equilibrium, it has to be that the asset price has to fall. So there's that moral hazard piece, which will lower asset prices. And then the, the inside money of the manager actually kind of offsets that, right? So if the manager has some of his own money to put at stake, that is free of moral hazard. So the inside capital of the manager acts as a way of reducing moral hazard. And it actually, it's not uh, clear here from, from this equation, but if you understood the previous slide, you'll realize it's coming in in two ways. One is the manager's own wealth is put into the fund to buy some of this credit art ABS. And uh, the outside investor is willing to put money proportionate to what the manager puts in. So there's sort of a multiplier here that's built into this uh, uh, capital W that the outside investor is willing to put in and that's the asset price. Uh, is the C actually a kappa on the second line? Yes, you're right. Um, sorry, my, my error there, that C is supposed to be a kappa on the second line. Okay, so that's the asset price. Um, so there's, there's basically two effects here. There's a moral hazard thing that'll push prices down. There's a capital effect that'll push uh, prices up. Uh, what's not clear from this expression is now if you sort of impose some aggregate risk here, the highest the asset price can be is E of R, right? So if the manager, this really should be maxed with E of R, the or minned with E of R. If the capital of the of the man, of the intermediary sector is sufficiently high, it can offset the moral hazard. Prices will never rise above expected returns because at that point, uh, the uh, investments both from the from the outside investors as well as the inside investors is negative NPV, so it'll never rise above E of R. But starting from there. If you imagine a situation in which moral hazard starts to rise, there'll be a point at which moral hazard will rise above kind of this capital buffer effect at which point prices will fall. And then once you're in that region where prices are below E of R, any marginal change in moral hazard capital will end up affecting asset price. And I, I want to kind of highlight this because the, the feature of this model is an asymmetry, right? It will be the case that changes in moral hazard and capital can only have an effect if you're in a region where capital is low and moral hazard is high. If capital is high, for example, changes in moral hazard have no impact on asset prices. Uh, likewise, 
uh, a change in capital, intermediary capital will only have an effect on asset prices if you're already in a region, say, where moral hazard is high. So it's really a kind of an interaction effect that uh, if you're in a state of the world where, where either capital is low or moral hazard is high, then any changes in moral hazard capital will have an impact on asset prices. Um, so this is just to kind of close up the model. Um, and I think I'm going to uh, move on unless there's any questions on this. Right. If, if you're and kind of putting this, this together, I think the, the main insight that comes out of here is we now have a kind of a clear understanding of how the moral hazard frictions and the intermediaries capital ends up affecting asset prices. They kind of go in two different directions and the impact is, is state dependent. It depends upon whether things are sufficiently high. So there's an kind of an asymmetry that's going to be built into here and I'll build on that more uh, as we go through. All right, uh, let me just back out for a second and just think about, uh, say, connecting this to a household Euler equation. So I've, as I said, I started off with a model in which only the, the intermediary managers can invest in the asset, but uh, that's certainly counterfactual. We can think of any cases in which there are households who directly, who bypass uh, intermediaries in making those investments. So let's suppose we were to introduce some sophisticated households who also participate in this asset market. And suppose they had some exogenous labor income, Y1, Y2 uh, income at date one. You can write down kind of a standard uh, uh, optimization problem for these agents who have to make a purchase of the asset uh, out of their labor income, in which case what I've written down is their utility function as well as their consumption stream at date one and date two. And you get what looks like a familiar asset pricing equation that takes um, as arguments uh, C2 and C1 uh into the utility function so you get the usual kind of uh, asset pricing equation so what is general equilibrium here it's now that the asset is purchased both by this agent this new agent the sophisticated household who purchases little theta of the asset and q which is purchased by our manager if you were to have data on say these uh sophisticated and i'm going to say wealthy households on their consumption stream it will be the case that uh, a household Euler equation will price the asset. That will be true. Now that doesn't negate, <laughs> it'll also be true that our previous equation here will also be uh, the case, it will also affect asset prices. So for example, if, 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 if I was to tell you that we were in a world in which both sophisticated households and these managers were holding this asset, and in that world, there was a shock that increased moral hazard. From the previous equation, it will be the case that the asset price will fall. Um, so that the intermediary friction ends up affecting the price of the asset. It'll also be the case in this model that the household's Euler equation will also apply. And the way this will, this will work out is effectively the, kind of the intermediary will pull out a little bit. Uh, the sophisticated households will step in a little bit, but then it'll adjust in a way that the asset price has to, the, the returns have to adjust to also equalize um, both margins for both the sophisticated household and the, and the intermediary. That's an entirely kind of reasonable thing to think about. One could understand asset pricing through both the lens of the uh, consumption Euler equation of the sophisticated households, as well as the intermediary. Now, I would say it's, if you think that the underlying shock that's moving asset prices say is a rise in moral hazard. And when I say rise in moral hazard, say think about uh, the fall of 2008 where you know, there's ample stories in which there were you know, good investments out there, uh, assets that were trading at uh, well below fundamentals. But if a, if a fund manager was to go out to his investors and say, please give me some money to buy, the, the, the investors will say, I don't understand what's going on. I'm you know, amply worried about all sorts of uh, uh, frictions in giving you money and you uh, frittering the money away that I'm not going to give you that money. So if you think about that world and, and a shock that increases moral hazard in that sense, it will be the case that asset prices are going to fall. And so in a way, a, kind of a, I would say a, a useful way of understanding an event like the fall of 2008, where almost surely contracting frictions between investors and, um, uh, and households rose is that part of the movement in prices say was an increase in these types of contracting frictions, which directly impacted asset prices, even though it's still the case that a household Euler equation holds. 
And in fact, you know, if from the standpoint of this model, both could be happening. It could be the case that um, consumption risk is going up and, and a moral hazard risk is going up. Both of those are, are possible outcomes of this model, which will both end up affecting asset prices. You can also think about kind of the, the reverse case. Imagine that labor income risk goes up uh, so that households pull out of holding the asset. The intermediary has to step in and buy the, more of the asset. So effectively, the amount that the intermediary needs to hold to clear the asset market rises, how will that end up affecting prices? That's effectively like in this equation, <clears throat> if capital theta um, was to rise, which will then um, you know, push, uh, push down asset prices even further. Right, so you can think of both versions of this model in, in which risk rises in the intermediary sector or risk rises in the household sector, both will end up affecting asset prices. Um, and it's useful to think about intermediation because by putting the lens on that, you understand how things that particularly affecting intermediation relationships end up affecting asset prices. And if you want to, that's sort of the heart of what I want to think about when you think about how and intermediation friction affects asset prices. That's that's uh, thinking about this moral hazard friction is a way of really grounding uh, why you need to think through a model. Um, I saw that there was a question, so I'm going to pause here and see if there's anything else on on this slide. Uh, so, in terms of yep. risk aversion specifically, I know we derived mm -hmm. um, moral hazard costs from a risk neutral framework, but here we're assuming that the sophisticated households are not necessarily yeah. risk neutral, right? So how yeah. do we kind of square those two? Yeah, I'll, I'll add in risk aversion on the managers in a second. It's it's not a, it's, um, yeah, just hold that thought. I, I don't think uh, there's any, uh, uh, there's a deep problem with connecting those two things. So just hold that thought for a second. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, so that's my kind of way of thinking about how. Uh, I think there was one more yep. question. Sorry, Alex. Yep. I think there was one more question. I just didn't want to skip it over. Tyler, did you... I can ask it. Thank you. Uh, so my question, Arun, was about so the mechanism where you describe the increase mm -hmm. in the moral hazard costs, and the yeah. result is that the household ends up managing more. This seemed to me to have a flavor of like an equilibrium, no arbitrage condition where. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the households could invest with the manager or they could manage on their own mm -hmm. and those returns have to equalize. And so if mm -hmm. you sort of lower the return to managing, then they have to manage more of the money and that's going to equalize. So, so is that, is that equal, is that the correct, correct way to think about why it's equilibrating or is there a different equation? That's exactly the correct way. I mean, you, you can think effectively the household intermediary kind of the unsophisticated household intermediary together is like kind of a one agent who's buying the asset. There's a sophisticated household who's the other agent who's buying the asset. And as in any two agent model, if one of the agents say um, is, looks like uh, the world is more risky from their standpoint, they'll hold less. The other agent has to hold more. And to induce him to hold more, asset prices have to adjust to offer him a higher return. So that's exactly what would happen in this world. If moral hazard was to rise, the intermediary unsophisticated household pair would pull out, the sophisticated household will have to bear more of the risk. And so asset prices would have to adjust. And then the same is true on the reverse side. If the sophisticated household said, I don't wanna to touch this stuff, um, risk is too high for me, he pulls out and the intermediary has to absorb more and asset prices have to adjust. So both are kind of pertinent ways of thinking about uh, the world in, uh, through this lens of this model. All right. Um, oh, I, I mean, I'll hold you up one more minute. Um, yeah. So typically, so so I like here you have the sophisticated guys Euler equation holding, uh, but the Euler equation of the intermediary doesn't look like it's going to hold because the IC constraint is binding. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it seems to me like we often test intermediary AP with the, you know, some proxy for the Euler equation of the intermediary. So in some sense, the evidence that we have from that literature might not be speaking to this model unless there's a way to cleverly kind of fold the kappa into the you uh, you want yeah you you kind of want equation. to want to kind of write an augmented uh right. uh euler equation for the intermediary that includes moral hazard right right if there's some co-movement there between the kappa and the w then it will work but um yeah. it's a yeah. little uh, yeah. hard to, to know whether that's the case 
I, I agree. So there's there's special cases of the model uh, in which um, sort of movements in W is a sufficient statistic for everything. But that's not a, a, a sort of a general result. And so I think you're you're exactly right. Um, so isn't isn't the paper by Haddad and Muir that's what they're about, right? They kind of, I mean, it's a particular way to address this problem, right? They're basically ranking cases by the degree of intermediation, trying to get at this issue. Yeah. So, but it kind of with yeah, you're right. That's one way of doing this, and you could think about different asset classes with different kappas, um, and that will give you some kind of headway on on time to do this. I, I thought Alexi was pointing out kind of a more basic problem, which is if you think that kappa itself is stochastic, which is sort of a, a reasonable thing to think about, then the intermediation um, Euler equation that is augmented to include kappa won't just be a simple kind of um, W-driven SDF. And so even when you do the cross-sectional thing, you also want to kind of think about um, accounting for kappa in some way. I mean, there's a, um, a clear reason to think they'll move together like your, your previous mm -hmm. slide when kappa goes up the, the asset price goes down and that's going yep. to create feedback look loop to w. w yeah um but but you were kind of you, you seem to have in mind that there could be some independent movement there and, and yeah I, I i i kind of agree i so i i emphasize kappa in these equations because if you want it's the new thing that's been added right if you okay, kappa is the thing that really is is very clearly about the contracting friction, about nothing else. Whereas movements in W look like movements in wealth, which in general, in, in asset pricing, we think should end up affecting demand for assets, whereas kappa is very unique to this. That's kind of why I've really stressed kappa as being the, the sort of the thing that is. Um, but if you ask me when I think about the world and think about asset pricing movements, should I think dominantly about measuring uh, movements in W to understand prices, or should I think about kappa? Um, it's probably W and probably because of what you just said, Alexi, which is Kappa itself and equilibrium will feed back into movements in W. And so then maybe W is enough to kind of get you going. But your core point is, I think, exactly right, which is that the, the test of this relationship based upon an SDF the intermediary should include both Kappa as well as, um, as well as W. And from what I have seen, most of the literature has not really focused on that. Um, it's focused mostly on W uh, or at kind of a higher level, just some type of um, reduced form contracting friction that might end up affecting asset prices. And I'll go through that um, in a second. But you know, possibly there's, if you could find some way to kind of measure kappa variation, I think you could do even better uh, in doing this. Okay. Um, just just to do a couple more experiments with this model. Um, let me do uh, one thing, which is to uh, shrink the managers in this economy um, or down to, to measure zero. I'll add unsophisticated households with income Y1 and Y2. Um, I think this is, this and the next slide will partly address uh, Tyler's question. <clears throat> uh, so same utility function, U of C1, C2. The asset market is segmented, so the unsophisticated households still can't buy the stuff. They need to go through the manager. But uh, let's suppose that there's no managerial moral hazard problem. That is, uh, the manager moral hazard problem here is all um, parameterized by kappa. So if, imagine kappa was zero, um, so that there was no moral hazard problem. What does that mean? The IC constraint here, which is that XH is less than or equal to RH minus kappa over delta, well, we're basically taking kappa to zero which means XH can be pushed to be equal to RH. So we'll set XH equal to RH, XL equal to RL. The intermediary here is basically a pass-through, right? Because there's no moral hazard friction, you don't have to kind of pay the manager anything in order to manage this fund. So all of the returns can be paid to the outside investors. This looks like kind of an equity mutual fund with no fees. Uh, you can put in a little bit of kappa and you can get a little bit of a fee in here. Uh, but this looks largely like an equity mutual fund with no fees. It'll still be the case that the world will look like the unsophisticated households are giving money to this manager who's then investing on their behalf. Uh, 
but because kappa is zero, this delegation problem is um, uh, turns out to be um, free in this model. That is, the intermediary is just a veil for reflecting the household's own portfolio preferences. And in fact, if there's an unsophisticated household here who's identical to the sophisticated households in terms of their utility and their income risk, then effectively an aggregate consumption cap M holds. Otherwise, there's sort of a two agent uh, consumption cap M. And in particular here, there's no moral hazard effect. So if you were to kind of think about that kappa shock I had before, that has no, no bite in this model. Uh, shocks to the capital of the intermediary also have no bite. So the things that show up from the micro intermediary asset pricing relationship drop out in this model uh, once you go into a world in which uh, delegation is free. Um, I, I, I go through this partly just to make the point that just because I, I observe in the world that intermediaries are trading a lot of an asset, it isn't the case that that immediately means that's evidence that intermediary asset pricing frictions end up affecting asset prices. Right. I could, the, 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 it could well be true that, say, broker dealers are trading the bulk of a collection of, say, interest rate swaps or a bunch of assets. Um, but it could be that they're just trading on behalf of their own investors, in which case their investors, they, they are themselves are availed. This is kind of a, the, the uh, Modigliani Miller uh, view of broker dealers. So in order for an intermediary friction to have a bite, you need to assume that there's some type of contracting friction that keeps the broker dealer's decision-making separate from his own uh, investors. Um, uh, so it's, it's, that makes this thing not, not uh, entirely obvious as to just making a statement that intermediaries are trading a lot of an asset. So as a result, it has to be the case that they must end up affecting asset prices. You need some, some, something else uh, to, to uh, get the intermediary friction to, to matter, okay? Um, all right, I, I'm just, I flagged this partly uh, for those of you who know the uh, Hey Kelly Manala paper. It's kind of worth thinking about that paper in the context of uh, how to think about it identifies intermediary frictions, but I'm not gonna say any more about this. All right, um, let, let me add one more piece to this model, um, which is managerial risk preferences. And I think this comes back to a, a question that came up earlier about uh, risk aversion and the standpoint of the managers and the unsophisticated households. Um, so um, just back up, uh, this is a key point in any delegation problem. Anytime a, in, a, an agent gives another agent uh, control over some decision, the, the second agent, the manager in this case, gets to choose the action. There's a separation between ownership and control from the standpoint of say, thinking about uh, a firm. And so that agent's own preferences will end up affecting asset prices, right? If, if the manager gets money from the investors and he has preferences that are potentially different from the uh, unsophisticated households, then his preferences will show up in asset prices in a way differently than his own. So if he's more risk averse, less risk averse, if he's risk seeking, all of the stuff will affect asset prices as soon as you put in, um, as soon as you put in uh, different preferences for the, uh, the intermediary manager, as well as the unsophisticated households. So I'll just do this in a slide to illustrate one point of this. And I'm, I um, apologize that the algebra looks heavy here, but the intuition I think is fairly clear. So take the, suppose managers were risk averse, and rewrite the IC constraint that I went through earlier. Now replacing everywhere that you had a payoff, say that first uh, line in that payoff, RH minus XH times Q, that's the payoff to the manager in the high state. Before it was linear preferences, so I didn't have a U of that. So now let's put in a U of that, um, given that the manager also has say uh, concave preferences over payoffs. So the IC constraint is the same as before, except all payoffs, <clears throat> are um, an argument into the utility function. Oops. Um, so take that, rewrite it. It's, it's almost the same as the uh, IC constraint before, except that the, the uh, IC constraint is now written in terms of utility differences between the high state and the low state, not payoff differences, 
So it's u of q times rh minus xh and u of q times rl minus xh. Utility differences between the high state and the low state have to be sufficient in order to incentivize the manager to put an effort. Now, with previously with risk neutrality, what you would do is you would set the payoff in the low state to, to zero to the manager and maximize the payoff in the high state. So basically maximize the gap between the low state and the high state payoff. With risk aversion, you won't want to do that. You'll never want to give the manager no payoff in the low state because he's risk averse. You won't want to go to a corner. Uh, which means you will have to put some, give him some payoff in the low state. Um, what does that mean? Effectively means since you're giving him some payoff in the low state, there's less payoff that is going to the outside investor. So effectively you're tightening the budget constraint of the uh, uh, intermediary at time zero. The manager, another way of saying that it won't lever up to the maximum given that it is risk averse. Um, as a result, he'll raise less funds. And so uh, the asset price in equilibrium will be lower. So if you, if you then add risk aversion to this and say risk aversion of the manager was to increase say because his own job risk or labor income risk rises, it will be the case that this manager will naturally pull back given that he's overexposed to the return on this fund. And when he pulls back, he'll reduce his outside financing and buy less of the asset which will then push down asset prices. So um, the manager's own risk preferences also play in, if you want, a, a much larger than normal role in this model, because all of the investment that's running through the intermediary sector is being funneled through this manager. And so things that end up uh, being his own concerns will end up playing a much larger role in setting asset prices. So when we kind of add intermediary asset pricing, there's a managerial preference effect, there's a moral hazard effect, there's a capital effect. Um, and all of these in principle should end up affecting asset prices uniquely once we move into this intermediary asset pricing framework. All right, and I ho hope this also addresses, I think uh, uh, there was a question earlier about um, concave preferences for managers and sophisticated households and unsophisticated households. Now you can kind of put everything on the same footing uh, in this model. All right, um, I'm gonna sort of shift over um, to thinking about how to identify uh, this intermediary asset pricing uh, friction in the data. And I'm, I think there's, there's some recent work on regulatory constraints and how regulatory constraints impact asset prices. And in particular, the next couple of slides is gonna be about the paper by Du, Tepper and Vertelhan, which is about a violation of covered interest parity, which is in my mind, very clear evidence that intermediary asset pricing ends up showing up in prices. Uh, and so I, I'm going to show you that evidence, but I just want to walk you through how this model that I've written down helps us think about that evidence. OK? So I, I took you through this um, slide before. It's just the, the balance sheet of the intermediary in this world. The intermediary holds, holds some assets. He raises some uh, debt financing and then has some insight and some outside equity. Okay, you can think about this model as, uh, as I said, the bank raises some debt and equity to buy assets. Define the leverage in this world of the intermediary. It's the amount of assets divided by um, the amount of equity of the of the intermediary. Now, um, uh, banks in the world uh, face a uh, a leverage constraint uh, imposed by regulators, which is that. Leverage, as I've just defined it, has to be less than some maximum. So for example, in, the, in, in Basel, it's 25. It's a 4% uh, uh, equity to assets ratio or a leverage maximum of 25. And that's a constraint that the, that the regulators impose on the banks. Now, the primitive incentive constraint of this model is that the maximum amount of equity that the intermediary raises is some multiple of the inside equity. So if the manager puts in W, the maximum equity that the intermediary can raise is one minus gamma over gamma, where gamma is the kind of inside stake of the, or share that you need to at least give the, the insider in order to, uh, to satisfy the IC constraint. Okay, so let me just make a kind of a, 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 a point here. If there's no primitive corporate finance friction, the regulatory constraint is always slack. 
right? If you impose a leverage constraint on a bank, but you have no failure of Mundy Glenny Miller, so you have no incentive constraint, then it'll never be the case that the leverage constraint will bind because if the leverage constraint was impinging on some portfolio decision of the, uh, of the bank, well, the bank can always just in principle raise outside equity in order to go out and, and uh, bypass the leverage constraint. So you still need some type of, of constraint on financing in order to, uh, to, for the regulatory constraint to affect asset prices. So you need to be in a world along the lines of what I've written down uh, in which Mary Glenn Miller is broken in order for the leverage constraint to end up affecting prices. So uh, I'm gonna take you through evidence in which the regulatory constraint affect, affects asset prices. And really it's directly implies that there must be some failure of uh, an incentive constraint somewhere or some binding incentive constraint that ends up affecting uh, prices. Right, I, could be, Arvind, yep, could it be yep. instead some kind of convenient liquidity premium on the riskless debt, like something ma making the riskless debt special? Uh, particularly attractive. Yeah. Um, I think that's a reasonable way to go as well, um, which is if, if it's advantageous to raise riskless debt, uh, so you want to kind of uh, push up leverage to that point, um, then that liquidity premium will end up showing up in the Euler equation that where you buy assets as well. I, that's kind of a, a reasonable way to think about the world as well. Um, I don't think that's gonna be consistent with the data I'm gonna show you. So if you want to just keep that thought, but I don't see how that'll line up with this data exactly. All right, sure. so here's the, uh, the evidence that I wanna take you through this. So this is, I, I hope most of you, no covered interest parity and no some of this evidence. So I'm just gonna fly through this. So covered interest parity is just relation between forward and spot exchange rate. Uh, the gap between forward and spot has to really be matched by the gap between interest rates in the two countries. Um, and you can define the difference, a kind of a gap, the, a failure of covered interest parity as a basis X here, which is forward minus spot minus interest rate differentials. And in a frictionless world, that basis should be zero. Right? Interest rate differentials should line up with forward minus spot differentials. Um, so let's kind of think about a, a world like that uh, in which in a frictionless world, the basis should be zero. Uh, that is covered interest parity should hold. And now I'm gonna kind of add in um, the intermediary friction and think about how that might end up affecting the basis, okay? So let's suppose we were in a world um, in which the leverage ratio constraint is binding on intermediary. So that balance sheet constraint that I wrote down was binding. Um, and imagine that a customer comes to, the, to an intermediary who has a given leverage today with a binding leverage constraint and says, I'd like to purchase Delta units of this FX forward, right? Um, in order to, to write one of these FX forwards, the intermediary needs to synthetically create the forward that involves a long position, a borrowing in one currency, a lending in another currency, and then a spot exchange rate transaction. That's the, the pairs of transactions that you need to do in order to uh, create a FX forward. That necessarily means the leverage of this intermediary will have to rise. He's borrowing. Uh, increases his liabilities. He has to invest in the foreign currency that invest, increases his assets. And then he writes the FX forward. That was gonna, at the margin, push up leverage, right? So um, the way I've written this equation is Delta comes in as an increase in uh, the demand for the FX forward that pushes up assets, pushes up liabilities. Uh, and as a result, increases leverage by Delta L prime, where L prime is the kind of the slope of the leverage curve to assets. Imagine that this, this uh, leverage constraint is binding and in the way that I, I took you through before, because say the incentive constraint is, um, is tight. Um, if the incentive constraint is tight, you can, you can, let me call Lambda the Lagrange multiplier on the incentive constraint, which then shows up as a Lagrange multiplier on the leverage constraint. If the intermediary was to write one of these FX forwards, he's gonna to, to run up against the leverage constraint and he needs to get paid, compensated to run up against the leverage constraint so that the uh, 
the arbitrage relationships between forwards, spots, and interest rate differentials has to be augmented to reflect this, uh, uh, this leverage constraint. So lambda L prime is the, is the, uh, is the cost of hitting the leverage constraint. Um, so that that equation I've written down uh, below is exactly has to be the, uh, the, the equilibrium relation that has to be satisfied by the intermediary in doing this forward. So that immediately means that the basis has to be the shadow cost of the leverage constraint. Right. Okay, so that's kind of what this model tells us about thinking about covered interest parity in a case in which the leverage constraint binds, since writing a forward will push up uh, assets and liabilities in a way that your leverage constraint will bind more, the basis uh, has to be equal to the Lagrange multiplier on this leverage constraint. And then linking this back to the theory I took you through before, that leverage constraint for it to bind, it has to be that a some type of breakdown of Moody-Glanner Miller has to apply. Uh, and so the, the breakdown of Moody Glenn and Miller will, will show up both in the in basis, the leverage constraint, and then thinking about the primitive intermediary asset pricing friction. All right. Um, let me uh, take you through some data, and then I think I'll pause and take some questions on this. Um, this is the euro dollar basis during the global financial crisis. Right, and um, if you look pre-crisis, this basis was basically zero. That is, covered interest parity held pretty well. Um, I, you know, pretty well is like looks like plus or minus five, ten basis points. So kind of within transaction counts, transaction cost uh, bounds. And then starting in 08, the basis starts to widen, and then particularly during the fall of 08, that basis widens to, you know, it looks like almost as high as 300 basis points. Um, and that basis was, you know, uh, around 50 and then kind of widens up again. It looks like in the European sovereign debt crisis uh, in 2011, 2012. So how does, how does the model make sense of this? The model says, well, it's the counterpart of the Lagrange multiplier, lambda. Uh, and so the model would say, look, in 2008, the Lagrange multiplier is high. Why is the Lagrange multiplier high? Uh, a, it could be that this incentive constraint is tight. So you can't go out and raise outside equity. If you can't go out and raise out outside equity, in order to write one of these FX forwards, you have to basically kind of reallocate your scarce equity towards writing forwards. So for example, um, if you have an existing investment, say a loan to some, uh, uh, you know, to some corporation or some other investment opportunity you have that is earning you a return RI, in order to keep your leverage the same and write this FX forward, you have to back out of one of those investment opportunities and then write the FX forward. That's a way of saying what that's the Lagrange multiplier on the leverage constraint. If in order to keep leverage the same, I have to back away from some potentially high return investment and then in, in return, write this uh, forward. So if this uh, a potentially high return investment is RI, that will be the shadow cost. That'll be the Lagrange multiplier on the leverage constraint. So one way of thinking about 08 is there for, for intermediaries, there are potentially high return investment opportunities. Uh, given that leverage, the leverage constraint is tight, they, they price every FX forward at the shadow cost of these other investment opportunities. And that's why uh, the basis widens. The other way of saying that is also, this is at the margin of the cost of going out and raising equity, which in the model I've written down is linked to that primitive IC constraint, the, uh, the moral hazard friction. And so a way of thinking about what's happening in 08 is, oh, moral hazard frictions are, are high, hard to go out and raise outside equity. Um, as a result, the, the Lagrange multiplier is as a result higher, and that pushes up this, um, this type of, uh, of basis. And that persists um, and, and kind of blows up again during the European sovereign debt crisis, because again, say moral hazard frictions are, are high. Okay, so that's kind of one way of understanding this, this uh, basis in relation to the model I just went down. Um, let me pause here and see if there's kind of any questions on this data as well as the model. And then I'm gonna do another cut of the data that's a little bit more intensive.
Okay, I hope I haven't lost uh, too many people in this exercise. And I should I should say if, if I've lost people, what I'm going through is from a paper that Jigo and I uh, wrote for um, one of the annual reviews on intermediary asset pricing. So you can sort of see this argument done in in words um, in in the paper that we wrote. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I have a question. If I can ask, please. Yeah. Uh, related to that basis, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, literature is there that, uh, you know, this basis is driven by money market reform in mm -hmm. uh, U.S. markets. Mm -hmm. So how you relate that reform to contracting friction? Um, so you can think about it in a bunch of different ways. Um, one way of thinking about the uh, money market reform is that it changes, say, the funding mix of European banks and American banks, and at the margin makes one set of banks costly to go out and raise uh, um, FX forwards or uh, financing in this market. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that, uh, and so that will sh that will show up in equilibrium in, in order to clear the FX forward market as a way of of raising this of increasing this basis. Uh, Another way of, of thinking about the basis is that the uh, with money market reform, funding to banks and dollars changes relative to funding uh, to banks in euros, for example. Say uh, it's cheaper for some banks to raise dollar financing relative to other banks for whom it's cheaper to raise euro financing. And so in, in that gap between who can raise funding in dollars and who can raise funding in euros, some banks are gonna to want to say raise funding in euros and then uh, swap it into dollars. So that creates a demand for the FX forward. This is sort of like theta increasing in the model that uh, I had written down. So another set of, of banks have to go out and intermediate and write these FX forwards. So they have to increase theta. And so markets have to clear in order for them to be happy with writing this theta. And so then that links back to you know, the Lagrange multiplier on these banks and providing these FX forward. So there's, there's a couple of different ways of, of thinking about it. Um, it has to be the case that though for banks who are writing the FX forward, who are active in this arbitrage, that the, the basis is their Lagrange multiplier. That always has to be the case. How it ends up showing up as being their Lagrange multiplier could happen in a couple of different ways. In asking them to write more forwards, less forwards, changing their cost of writing forwards, all of that kind of are different ways of affecting this uh, this lambda, this Lagrange multiplier. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think uh, um, uh, the way you are writing the model is that you have the consumers and they have a different utility function, and then you have intermediaries. But uh, you know, thinking in practical terms. In the market terms, I think uh, uh, what you are saying that there might be consumer and intermediary within the intermediary sector, right? Within the banking sector. Within the intermediary, there might be different types of intermediary. And I, I actually, in a way, I'm, what I'm going to show you next is a, a different cut of the data. Within the intermediary sector, they have different constraints. And so it might be different Lagrange multipliers and different intermediaries that could be showing up in these prices. That's also kind of a plausible way of thinking about the data. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, in fact, so uh, let me show you then <clears throat> another version of this, which for me is in a way the most convincing evidence that from this paper that it is about an intermediary balance sheet friction rather than kind of anything else that is playing that is showing up in these uh, prices. Um, <clears throat> this is the basis um, plotted over time. And you'll notice here that there are these, these, these particular places in which the basis spikes, okay? Those, those spikes are quarter ends. Um, so let's think, uh, first of all, about writing a three month FX forward for an intermediary. Uh, and let me just start off by thinking about an intermediary who regulated based upon a leverage constraint on a daily basis. So every day the regulator comes in and looks at the intermediary and says, what's your leverage? And 
uh, averages that leverage over, say, a three-month period and imposes a leverage constraint based upon your leverage leverage. That's actually how uh, U.S. banks are regulated uh, based upon this average leverage constraint. All right. If you are such an intermediary, then the Lagrange multiplier that's relevant is the, the lambda on each day uh, of an FX forward you write. So if you write a three-month FX forward, the, the relevant thing that'll show up in your first order condition is the, Lang the Lagrange multiplier today, that it's expected to be tomorrow, that it's expected to be the day after, every day for the next three months. So that the basis will reflect what I've written down uh, in the bottom here, which is the kind of average expected Lagrange multiplier for the next three months. Now, there are in the world two types of, of banks that are active in this covered interest parity in writing these FX forward. They're European banks and American banks. And what I just described is the, an American bank's leverage constraint. A European bank is only, only regulated at quarter end based upon a snapshot. So for a European bank, the rel relevant le leverage uh, constraint is the lambda just at one single date at quarter end. And at that date, the, the Lagrange multiplier is very uh, tight. So the lambdas are very high for uh, that date. And so on that date, what happens in the world is European banks pull out uh, of writing FX forwards and American banks uh, pick up the slack so that they're the ones who are writing most of the forwards. What that means is it's gotta be the case that a pattern of lambda, if I was to be able to plot a lambda time series, it will look like it's relatively low and then it jumps up, a daily lambda will jump up at quarter end, come down back the day after quarter end and then stay low. And this is, uh, there was a the question earlier about money markets. You, you know that in money markets, there are quarter end effects. This is a particular version of that. At quarter end, uh, the leverage constraint will necessarily be tighter because of regulatory constraint, which will push up lambda. Now, going back to the first order condition for the uh, CIP forward, it has to be the case that that'll show up then in uh, CIP forwards. And in particular, forwards that cross quarter end will reflect the potential jump in these lambdas over quarter end, which will push up the CIP violation. And that's exactly what you see in the data. You see that um, um, CIP forwards whose maturity crosses quarter end. So look at the red line, that's a one week CIP forward. And as the maturity of that contract crosses the quarter end, it, the basis blips up uh, and then comes right back down once you cro cross quarter end. That pattern is a very clear indication that the forward pricing in this relation is very closely tied to banks uh, leverage constraints. So if you want from me from this paper, that's sort of the clearest evidence <laughs> that a, um, an, a constraint that's unique to intermediation is showing up in prices and it's showing up in this particular way. Now that's of course, just focusing on quarter end and noticing at quarter end that this thing is showing up. If I back out though, like I did here, I think it's showing up everywhere. Um, and it's showing up for kind of in different ways at different times, um, but it's sort of a, a useful gauge if you want to of the Lambda of the, of the intermediary. And that's why I find this kind of a, a, a useful uh, device to think about intermediary asset pricing um, constraints. There are some, there are many papers that have pursued this angle more closely and thought say about writing down a, um, a kind of an intermediary asset pricing test using variation in the CIP deviation as a measure of the SDF. And that's kind of a way one could go with this. Um, let me stop there. All right, I'll, I'll do uh, kind of one more thing and then I'm gonna take a break here. Um, this is the asset pricing equation I'd written down before from that a model. Um, so I, sorry, I see a hand raised. Yeah, sure. Arvin, just one question I wanted to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, your data do show there is a constraint out there, but how do you relate it to model hazard? Is it like uh, uh, you are so saying I that yeah, so what I'd say is for a constraint to end up affecting prices, a leverage constraint, a regulatory leverage constraint, it must have been the case that the financing of the intermediary was constrained. That's about all I can say. Okay. Right? That is another way of saying that is, look, if, if you 
see this behavior of the FX forward, there is a um, positive NPV investment for anyone who's writing the FX forwards at quarter ends or in the fall of 08. And if the constraint in writing this FX forward is your ability to raise financing, your leverage, well, then you should be able to go out and raise equity and debt financing in order to write this forward. So the fact that this thing blows up, it, another way of looking at it is it must have been costly to raise mm -hmm. debt and equity. The model mm -hmm. I wrote down says, oh, you know, the cost of raising equity was the uh, deep moral hazard friction. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's how you, you tie this back. Now, I've taken a very particular stand on a model, a, particularly a moral hazard friction that gives rise to a, a breakdown between financing and investment. Um, I, if I would say that the model doesn't identify moral hazard. <laughs> it identifies that there's some type of corporate financing friction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's many flavors of corporate financing friction that one can think about. For example, um, you know, my, my colleague here, Daryl Duffy, has been pushing a version of a corporate financing friction, which is debt overhang, which also mm -hmm. can make sense of this data in the same way. So uh, this data doesn't identify uniquely moral hazard. It just identifies our corporate financing friction. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and to be honest, I don't, I'm not going to push moral hazard as the thing in the world. Um, I think what I take away from this is that corporate financing frictions are useful for thinking about asset pricing. That's kind of what looking at the world through the lens of intermediary asset pricing. I've taken this, this moral hazard thing and written it down just to be very precise on uh, taking a stand on one thing and running it through so that we can see how that plays out. But one could have written down the exact same model I've, I've written down, say, with a, with an adverse selection friction or a debt overhang problem. There's many versions of this that I think could give rise to the same patterns. There's potentially some differences um, and that, that are worth studying, but I'm not highlighting them at this point. OK, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Sorry, I, I'm, um, I see hands raised, but I don't see the names. Hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Arvin. So uh, this is uh, Claudia uh, talking. So, um, so I think of, so leverage uh, is the proxy for, in the, uh, for financial intermediaries marginal value of wealth, and that's why it enters the intermediary SDF. Now, um, if I think about- no, no, Hang on, like, you, 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 sorry, Claudia, you spoke too fast. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, no, no, I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna back you up and say, uh, if there's a constraint on leverage, right? So if there is a constraint, if there's a constraint on leverage, there's a Lagrange multiplier on that constraint. That Lagrange multiplier shows up in the Euler equation of the intermediary. That's all, all I want to say. You said something different. You said it's the intermediary's marginal value of wealth. Mm -hmm. That's not entirely obvious. You have to play with models to to see exactly how it maps into the Euler equation intermediary. Okay, okay. So um, what I was going, I was thinking about um, the, uh, the uh, thing that uh, you said about the, uh, the moral hazard. So um, I'm wondering whether the, the cost, so if the moral hazard is more, uh, if there's a higher penalty for moral hazard during uh, illiquid times. So yes. when you have, Tighter mm -hmm. funding conditions. So, yep. so you, can you enter a K through a liquidity? Uh, in yeah, the yeah. I, I, I think that's that's entirely plausible. Um, you can think about, say, <clears throat> kappa being higher during particular times, like times at which um, moral hazard is high, or maybe times when markets are less liquid. I think that's entirely plausible. Of course, you can also tell the story in reverse, which is what I'm going to do in this slide, which is a world in which uh, markets are, in which moral hazard is high, might be a world in which uh, intermediaries have less resources to make markets, to buy assets, which might in the end result make markets less liquid. Um, and Claudia, you could um, think about models in which that illiquidity then feeds back to increasing the moral hazard friction, which then kind of multiplies things. That seems uh, entirely plausible as well. Right, then you can relate that to capital constraints, right? And I, I mean, as, as, soon, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. As soon as you have uh, corporate financing friction like this moral hazard, capital constraints immediately pop out. As soon as capital constraints pop out, regulatory frictions will have bite. Right, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to kind of uh, follow on that uh, line of argument, I think the main, the, what I want to, uh, the point I want to make in the slide is that if you're in a model of this type, a very natural thing that'll uh, arise is a nonlinear amplification mechanism, right? So start off at that equation up at the top, the asset pricing equation, and let's suppose you made the model dynamic. So I added kind of a date zero. Then that means that at date zero, this intermediary will have a portfolio that will be exposed to this asset. And in particular, the capital of the intermediary will be increasing in, in P1. Um, so now you very naturally have a, a amplifier built into the model. If there's some date one news that's bad, say low expected returns or say a high kappa at date one, that'll decrease P1. If it decreases P1, it'll decrease W1 because W1 is increasing in P1, which then decreases P1 further, et cetera. Right, so this is the sort of spiral that shows up in this type of model. Um, Hopefully that's clear. The second thing that I want you to notice from this model is that this multiplier effect, this spiral, depends on the state of the world we're in. If we're in a state of the world in which capital effects are not present, moral hazard effects are not present, that is price is close to expected R, the spiral effect won't operate at all, right? It only operates once you're in a region in which these moral hazard and capital effects uh, show up. That is, this model will deliver amplification, but also a state contingent amplification. The state of the world matters. If you're in bad states of the world, shocks will get amplified. If you're in good states of the world, shocks don't get amplified. That comes out very naturally out of this model. Um, and the last thing that I was gonna do is just uh, show a slide of, uh, this is a paper that I have a GIGO on the AR from 2013, which really, tries to sort of deliver this nonlinear amplification mechanism. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show you that. All I'm gonna do is just show you one picture, which is from this model. Uh, the, the Look at the left uh, picture here. W is the wealth of the intermediary. And uh, the dashed line here is the risk premium that comes out of the model. And the most interesting feature of this model is that as if you're on the right side, uh, high Ws, risk premium are basically flat and relatively invariant to W. If you're way on the left, W is low, risk premium are high, and any shocks to W push up risk premium even more. So you get kind of a, a very naturally a nonlinear amplification mechanism. And this nonlinearity is the thing that I think is most interesting about uh, what we did. And I'll, I'm gonna use that next to talk about uh, banking crises, right? So, um, I've gone for an hour and a half here, so let me just stop here and take a, uh, how long a break have you guys been taking, Alexi? Let's do 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So when yeah. we take a 10 minute break and then restart at 7.40 uh, my time, yeah. uh, 9.40 East Coast time, or 10.40 East Coast time. Thanks. And I can I can stick around if there's uh, any questions or everything I've, we've gone through so far. Uh, yes, just a quick question. I'm um, going back to the um, the general equilibrium model setup. So uh, we're presuming then that the sophisticated household income isn't observable, right? Because otherwise, then there could be a partition of the estate space if the intermediary puts in low effort. Um, sorry, I, I I missed this. Oh, sorry. Let me um, let me rephrase this. I, maybe it was a a, a bit too. Uh, so. If the household, if the sophisticated households have a certain success probability and the intermediaries can choose to shirk, which reduces their success probability, right? So mm -hmm. wouldn't that effectively partition the state space, resulting in some states where the sophisticated households succeed, but the intermediaries fail, right? Um, I don't think so. The the. I see what you're saying. You're saying, let me rephrase your question. Your, your question to some extent is, if there are other households, other uh, 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 investors, and actually let, let me uh, rephrase your question a different way. Suppose there are some intermediaries, say one intermediary in the world who has no moral hazard friction, 
right? Uh, can you use them as a benchmark to figure out that other intermediaries are shirking? Right, exactly. That, that's that's your question, right? Can you kind of write some type of relative performance contract that says, you know, I got one guy who I know isn't shirking. <laughs> can I use them to kind of figure out uh, that other guys are, are not shirking? Uh, yeah. And the answer mm -hmm. is, you know, generally, you're absolutely right. If you write down a moral hazard problem with many agents, then using information from how each of them are doing can help uh, decrease your moral hazard friction. And so, you know, if you back out of that, you need to put some sand in the gears in, in doing that. Okay, and then following from that, um, so my intuition in that setup then is you could put a arbitrarily high degree of penalty on deviations from the benchmark and then mm -hmm. sort of redu like reduce any chance of generating costs of intermediation in the, the optimal yeah. setup, right? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with all that. Okay, I see. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be clear, kind of, I've, we've written down a fairly simple model. And the model is written in order to highlight how it is that something like a moral hazard friction will end up affecting asset prices. All right, that's, that was really the objective of uh, this exercise. I see. Thank you. Mm So let's resume. It's exactly ten forty. Let's let's okay. resume. It just right. just very just very quick, uh, everyone. I put a link in the chat um, to a form. It'd be great if you filled out to tell us if you could attend a, a rescheduled talk by Antoinette Shore. Uh, that would be really useful. Thanks a lot. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. So the the second part of what I want to talk about was just uh, discussing how this intermediary model that I've written down or, uh, is useful for thinking about macro. And it, this really builds on this last point I made, which is one of the features of this degree model is it can give rise to this sort of spiraling effect, this amplification effect. And in particular, it's state contingent. It happens more in bad states than in good states. Uh, and that's an attractive feature of this model, in particular to shed light on financial crises we think of financial crises, these very nonlinear events where, you know, much of the time things that are happening to the financial sector have sort of small effects on the economy, but it, when you fall into some uh, particularly bad states, then um, shocks to the financial sector might have particularly large effects, right? And uh, financial crises have these very nonlinear patterns uh, that this model may be very used to, uh, useful for addressing. So. That's where I'm gonna go with this. Um, I'm gonna do two things. One, I wanna just walk you through some facts. Um, and the facts will be the facts that the, in the end, I'm going to use, I'm gonna to try to address uh, in the model, okay? So let's go through facts. All right, so this is um, uh, data on uh, 41 financial crises over a historical period from 1870 to 2014. Um, this includes the the 2008 financial crisis, but also includes a number of uh, historical financial crises, including Great Depression, and then a bunch of crises in the late 1800s around the world. Okay, um, and if you want to make sense of financial crisis, you kind of need to go historical, and you need to go um, across both um, the developed world as well as the developing world. Um, to kind of get enough crises because crises are fairly rare events. And that's what is in this picture. And I'd say this is representative of a larger uh, literature that has developed over the last several years, looking, studying uh, historical financial crisis. I noticed that last year, uh, Alan Taylor gave one of these talks uh, and he has a nice set of slides uh, on this stuff. So really, I'm just gonna show you four slides, but if you wanna know more, 
go look at his, his stuff. All right, so date zero here is a financial crisis. Uh, minus five is five years before our crisis. Um, and plus five is five years after. Let's start on the right-hand side here. This is the path of GDP around a financial crisis. Uh, we get a fairly big decline. This is a mean path around these 41 financial crises, a decline in output of uh, nearly 8%. And then there's a long uh, tail here. It takes a while to recover. Um, this is something that many people have uh, pointed out. It seems like the recovery from financial crisis is relatively slow. This is the path of credit to GDP. And this is credit uh, primarily measured as loans from the banking sector relative to output. You get a big boom in the pre-crisis period, uh, big growth in credit. And then at time zero, the crisis hits and then there's disintermediation. There's less credit. Uh, it almost unwinds fully uh, by year five. The left-hand side is credit spreads. Think of this as something like a triple A, B, double A spread. Uh, of course, this is across many countries, uh, including, in, including some historical data. So it's not possible to construct perfectly a triple uh, A, B, double A spread. Um, so you have to do some kind of playing with the data in order to uh, get an equivalent spread measure. Once you do that, this is what you find. You find that uh, credit spreads pre-crisis are minus 0.2. That you should think of that as 0.2 sigmas below average. Zero is average here, and then there's a jump up around the time of a crisis, and then it takes a while for uh, spreads to come back down. Sort of tracking a gradual recovery. Uh, this is from a paper I have with uh, Tyler Muir, and the banking crises here are dated. They're dated narratively by uh, Jorda Shalarik and Taylor. Here's a very similar picture. Uh, in, uh, by Baron, Werner, and Zhang using uh, an, a crash in bank equity prices as the dating of when a financial crisis happens. Um, what I showed you in this picture is deviations from uh, GDP trend. This picture is the red line is trend, and then the blue line is actual GDP. And you see a kind of a similar pattern, uh, growth in GDP, a big decline, relative trend uh, after the equity crash and then kind of stay away from trend for uh, quite a number of years. This is the credit to GDP are again around date zero being the equity crash. You get a run up relative to trend and then a disintermediation uh, post crisis. Those were pat uh, patterns around mean financial crisis. Uh, here is patterns in the cross section. So. If you look within financial crises, you see some crises are bigger than others. So, you know, the Great Depression is a big financial crisis. There are other crises that are smaller. In some sense, 2008 is smaller than Great Depression. Um, so if you look within crises, you see that they, the uh, GDP growth, three-year GDP growth after a crisis is left skewed. So um, there's a kind of a tail here that shows up in the data. And there are patterns that allow us to discriminate among the tail. Uh, and, and I think the most important one, the one that I'm going to emphasize uh, in the model that I write down is that if you enter a financial crisis in which you enter with high leverage in the financial sector, think of high leverage as credit has grown a lot in the years before a crisis so that the banking sector looks levered that ends up picking up more of these points on the left tail. So higher leverage or lower bank capital entering crisis ends up giving you more of these left tail events. Likewise, it's the case that at the start of a crisis, if credit spreads really spike a lot, you end up also with more left tail events, right? So this within financial crises, you can discriminate between ones that are worse and smaller. And among the type of variables that allow you to discriminate are things like the leverage or the capital of the banking sector, and how much the disruption is in credit markets measured by uh, change in credit spreads. Um, here, for example, is this is from Jordan Shalarik and Taylor looking at credit growth uh, during financial crisis and um, plotting how the path of output varies across uh, situations in which you came into the crisis with higher and higher credit growth. So the bottom line here is if credit growth was 3% above mean uh, entering the crisis, how much worse is the GDP tail relative to if credit growth was at the mean level? 
And uh, effectively, you see that if credit growth coming into the crisis was higher, you're going to pick up more of these lower tail events so that uh, output falls more and takes a longer time to recover. Right. And I, I also find this to be a kind of a useful picture from uh, George Sherlock and Taylor. This is if you are entered with higher levels of credit growth in a recession, so not a banking crisis, you also see some effect on output, but it's much more dampened relative to the crisis. So credit growth seemed to be particularly uh, this, this credit variable conditioning on how severe the outcome is, is particularly salient during financial crises, less so during um, normal recessions. And that makes sense from the standpoint of the model in the sense that it gives you kind of a, a nonlinear multiplier that's more relevant during uh, really bad events. This is the same thing with bank capital. If you enter a crisis with low bank capital, you end up with a much worse uh, GDP tail outcome. Uh, okay, so this is discriminating among um, financial crises. There's another fact that uh, comes out in the literature um, that I want to highlight. And that is, don't think about a financial crisis per se and how a financial crisis plays out. We know that a financial crisis is, uh, plays out a big drop in output, slow recovery, um, crisis is bigger if you came into the crisis with a big run up in leverage or low levels of bank capital. Let's think about what types of things predict crises, right? And so following what I just discussed, one of the things that, one of the variables that has some predictive power for financial crises is high credit growth. If you go through a period in which credit growth is particularly high, that looks like the likelihood of a financial crisis following is higher not enormously higher. Unconditional probabilities of crises are like 4%. If credit growth is one sigma above unconditional, it increases the crisis probability from 4% to like say six and a half or 7%. Uh, so higher credit growth predicts more crises and more egg equity crashes of the kind uh, that I showed you from the uh, Baron Werner Schonk paper. Um, so that's interesting and, and makes sense from the data I've just talked you through. But something that's, I think, uh, uh, equally interesting is that higher credit growth also predicts lower uh, risk premium, lower excess returns in the bond and the stock market. And at first glance, that's surprising because you might think to yourself, if you're going through a period in which credit growth has been high, and such a period is one in which crises are more likely to happen, that might lead you to think, ah, the world is more, looking more risky if credit growth has been high, and if investors are forward-looking, they should ask for a higher risk premium on risky assets. That would make sense, for example, if you think about these crises as, say, uh, rare disasters, as um, the likelihood of disasters rising, which is, say, correlated with higher credit growth, you might think that that means that risk premium should be rising. That's not the pattern in the data. The pattern in the data is higher credit growth implies more disasters, but it also implies lower excess returns. So lower risk premium, even though crash risk is rising. That's surprising. Um, that is a, a fact from a paper by Baron Zhang. Uh, there's a, a fact that is very related that um, I have in a paper with Tyler, which is credit spreads also look below normal before crises, uh, which actually I showed you in the first picture already. So in this period of high credit growth where crash risk is rising, credit spreads are also low. Again, a bit surprising from an asset pricing standpoint. And um, a higher credit growth and uh, a period of low credit spreads look like they predict crises. Closely related high credit growth and stock market runups look like they precede crises as well, All right? So uh, this is telling us something about the preconditions to financial crises. It looks like periods in which credit growth are high, asset market risk premium are low, seem like, um, periods in which uh, crises are more likely. So I'm going to move on to writing a model to make sense of this data. And just backing out the, the way I see this data is there's a crisis cycle that emerges when you start looking at all this data. And the crisis cycle looks like there's a pre-crisis period in which credit growth is high, uh, asset prices are elevated, risk spreads are low. Then there's some something, some episode, some some sharp trigger that pushes you into a financial crisis. Uh, 
you get a big contraction in output, you get a big contraction in credit, you get a big rise in spreads, and then it takes uh, quite a while for you to recover out of the crisis, right? Um, those are the patterns that the data appear. And uh, what I'm gonna take you through next is a model which tries to make sense of these patterns, okay? So before I jump into the model, I just want to pause and see if there's any questions in the facts that I've laid out. Uh, these are the facts that I'm going to address next in, uh, through the lens of a model. Okay, um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write down a model. It's um, related to the, the kind of intermediary asset pricing model I wrote down earlier, but I'm, this is really a macro model that I'm going to write down, so it's going to have a different flavor to it, but hopefully some of the intuitions that came across from the earlier model will show up here. So there's going to be a financial intermediation sector. The key feature of the intermediation sector that uh, this model is going to be written to deliver is this amplification mechanism, whereby if banks lose money, uh, they're going to disintermediate. This is the model I'm going to write down is one in which both asset prices are endogenous as well as output is endogenous. <clears throat> so when banks lose money, there's going to be a credit contraction. Output's going to fall. Risk premium are going to rise. Asset prices will fall. Um, that'll further create losses to banks, which will further deplete their equity capital. So there's kind of an amplification mechanism along the lines of what I highlighted earlier. Uh, and I'll, we'll, I'll put that at play in this model, okay? Um, and what I'm gonna show you is that that type of model naturally generates two things. It generates this sort of nonlinearity uh, that is useful for explaining why you get very left skewed outputs uh, during a crisis, why you get really bad realizations in a crisis. Um, it also can uh, match the aftermath of a crisis given a shock that pushes the economy into a crisis, All right? And I'll show you that. Um, I'm going to add another ingredient to this model, um, which I think is interesting in and of itself, but I think is particularly interesting in conjunction with this intermediation mechanism that uh, I'm going to build in. And this other mechanism is one in which uh, beliefs are time varying. So there's a narrative about financial crises. I think um, maybe you can trace this back to Kindleberger that thinks about crises as um, effectively uh, kind of a bubble bursting in which um, you know investors in the world are optimistic for a period of time, and then you know something causes them to revise their beliefs dramatically, and so they become very pessimistic, and then there's a big bubble burst. So there's a uh, that there's a narrative out there uh, about crises. I'm going to try to build some of that to the data, okay? Um, and adding this ingredient, I think, is particularly useful for two reasons. One is crises are very sharp, right? They, there's a big jump in a crisis, and you need some type of trigger. Um, and the most likely trigger seems to be about news. If you think about 2008, we're kind of going along, and then you know, we, we, the world seems to have kind of re reassessed its uh, thoughts on how housing related assets were priced. So something, some, some set of news triggered a revaluation. Once you trigger a revaluation, then endogenous amplification mechanisms will kick in in this model. For example, banks that are highly levered will get themselves in trouble, which will further decline asset prices, et cetera, et cetera. So you need some sort of trigger news, news or Information seems like the most right, uh, likely one, so that I'll build that in. Um, there's a narrative about crises, which is, um, I'd say I'm gonna ascribe this mostly to uh, Gary Gordon and Ben Holmstrom who've written a series of papers about this, which is to think about crises as event information revelation events. They think of the banking sector as being sort of intentionally opaque so that much of the time you don't really understand what the risks are. And what is a crisis? It's a, it's a situation in which you suddenly figure out, whoops, I see some bodies buried here. And these are bodies that are uh, potentially a big source of risk. This idea that uh, opacity is an integral part of the financial intermediation mechanism and crises are the unfortunately the cost of opacity, which is every now and then you'll find something out that uh, you didn't expect. And then that puts you in a position where, um, you might get crises and amplification, 
Uh, think of, you know, say the CDS that was written by AIG or the high amounts of leverage that were sitting in the financial sector uh, in 2008. Okay, so that's uh, one place in which uh, news or beliefs or information is going to be relevant. And then the other place in which it's going to be relevant is to get this pre-crisis build up. I think the, uh, the intermediation mechanism by itself is going to have a hard time trying to reconcile why it is that um, credit is growing, you're more likely to get into a crisis, but yet it looks like risk spreads are low. Uh, that's a very hard thing to get in through a pre or intermediation mechanism. It seems much closely tied to some type of variation in risk assessment in the world. And so I'll show you that comes out naturally. Uh, you can think of it as either optimism, you can, might be even think of it as over-optimism in a, a behavioral way. So I'll, we'll play with models that are both rational as well as behavioral to think about uh, the belief fluctuation coming in, okay? All right, so let me take you through a model. This is a macro model rather than a pure asset pricing model, uh, but the structure is similar to what we had before. So there's two agents in this model. Uh, there's bankers and there's households. They both have log utility. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to assume here in reduced form, so no primitive uh, contracting friction here. I'm just gonna assume in reduced form. Bankers only raise demandable debt. And the only form of equity that they have is inside equity. So they don't raise any outside equity finance. What is inside equity? It's the banker's wealth. So the W is present. There's no outside equity raised here. The only type of outside financing that bankers raise is uh, demandable debt. Raising demandable debt, of course, pushes up leverage of the bankers. Um, so there's gonna be a kind of a risk return leverage trade-off that I need to uh, clarify as I go through this model. Uh, the bankers raise resources, and this is a real model. So they they produce um, production. I'm going to think about as the bankers sort of direct their resources into some positive uh, investment opportunities. And if bankers have resources to do this, then capital has productivity of a upper bar. Households can also directly uh, send their resources into capital. Uh, if they do so, then productivity is a lower bar. So bankers are useful in this model. The gap in the, of how bankers are useful is a upper bar minus a lower bar. So this is a two agent model in which the distribution of wealth between bankers and households is going to affect both asset prices as well as uh, real outcomes. Uh, how much it affects asset prices and real outcomes is in part a function of the frictions in this model, uh, the ability to raise demandable debt, a function of endogenous stuff, which is how much wealth bankers have, how much leverage they're taking, and a function of exogenous stuff like what the gap is between bank productivity and household productivity. These basic features have been well explored by a large literature. Uh, this model I'm writing down is most close to, uh, closely related to, say, Kiyotaki Moore or Bruno Meyer Sanikov's uh, more recent version of Kiyotaki Moore. Okay. Um, all right. So here is sorry, here's the capital accumulation process. So there's, there's a single type of capital stock in this world uh, that's used to produce output. The growth in capital from one period to the next um, comes from growth. Growth is investment. Uh, investment in this model is just Q theory. So I'm going to, in a little while, define the price of capital. It's an endogenous object in this model. If the price is higher, there's gonna be more investment, which means um, the growth rate in capital will be higher. So that's a way in which asset prices endogenously affect capital growth. And since capital is closely related to output, uh, it'll end up affecting output. Okay, so that's an endogenous thing there. Depreciation is exogenous. And then there's uncertainty. There's shocks here in the model that'll show up uh, that can kind of increase or dis decrease, destroy capital. Uh, this is sort of a reduced form way of putting in TFP shocks. We're putting in here, not in productivity, but directly into the capital stock uh, because it's easier to, to um, work with um, in this class of models, okay? I want you to think of these DB shocks as sort of real TFP shocks that are happening all the time. There's a second shock, which I'm going to introduce into this model. It's a kind of a pure financial shock. It's purely related to the financial intermediation sector that we've built into this model. 
and it's basically a bank run shock. So I will assume that um, uh, with Poisson intensity lambda tilde, there's a sunspot that realizes. And if it realizes, then all of the debtors, the households to the, to the intermediary, remember the, the corporate finance of this model is the intermediary has borrowed via demandable debt from the households. So if one of these shocks hits, then all the debtors will go to the intermediaries and demand their funds back. They'll pull out their money as in a bank run. In order to make good on their debts, the, the bankers have to sell their capital. They sell their capital and then they pay back the debts. Okay. Uh, if the bankers sell their capital, uh, they encounter an illiquidity discount alpha naught. This is exogenous. It's also possible that endogenously the price of capital could decline with these sales. Um, I'll say more about that. Uh, it'll turn out that this endogenous capital price decline is going to be related to the model I showed you before. If the world is, is closer to a state of the world in which bank wealth is low, then you're going to get a big endogenous capital price decline. And so there's going to be kind of a multiplier built in here. Otherwise, the only cost is the illiquidity discount. If the illiquidity if discount is the only cost, then effectively what will happen is if leverage is not too high, the shock hits, debtors demand their money back, bankers sell some of their capital, they pay the illiquidity cost, but they can sell just a little bit of their capital, pay the illiquidity cost, and they'll be fine going on. There's no, um, there's no real effects of the bank run. Okay, so, um, and this is going to be important for where I go. These shocks happen, but their impact on asset prices and on output is going to be a function of endogenous stuff, and in particular, leverage and capital of the banking sector. If leverage is low and capital is high, one of these bank run shocks has a very small effect on outcomes. Whereas if leverage is high, then these bank run shocks can be potentially destabilizing to the economy. And that's also another way in which we're gonna be able to say something about why crises are, are bad tail events. So as I just said, high leverage plus an illiquidity shock may lead to a banking crisis. This is a good um, equation to think about uh, when you think about this model. Um, Alexei, you've, you've read this paper and seen this paper before. This is uh, actually drawing directly from your discussion. So thanks for that discussion. Uh, you want to think about the probability of the crisis in this model as basically being proportional to the leverage of the banking sector times the likelihood of one of these illiquidity shocks. So it's a model in which if leverage is high and when these illiquidity shocks hit, then a crisis will occur. So the probability is uh, very closely related to leverage times lambda tilde. Lambda tilde, again, is the intensity of these uh, illiquidity shocks, right? To keep this equation in mind, it's gonna be useful for understanding, I think one of the more, the more nuanced results of this model. Um, all right, so shocks, um, as I said, think of this Brownian shock as a kind of a real productivity shock. The illiquidity shock is a pure financial shock, right? It's a pure bank run shock. And as you'll see in a, in a, in a second, if banks are well capitalized, it has a very small effect on output asset prices or anything. So it's not a consumption disaster, it's a bank run. Whether or not it translates into a consumption disaster depends upon whether or not banking sector leverage is high. So its impact is endogenous. So uh, a way of thinking about this illiquidity shock is we know that in both 2008 and in 2020 last spring, there was an element of a bank run in 2008, you know, Lehman, money market funds, there was a clear element of a bank run. Uh, in 2008, uh, the banking sector was pretty highly levered. There was lots of buried bodies out there so that the run ended up having a spiraling effect on asset prices and output, which then uh, created a financial crisis. In 2020, we also saw a run of a, of a sort. It really happened, I think, in my mind, in the mutual fund sector. Uh, the corporate bond market uh, went through um, uh, an illiquidity period, but it didn't really have a much of an impact on outcomes. The out output was largely driven by the health crisis, COVID, rather than the financial element of the bank run. And a way of thinking about that through the lens of the model I'm going to go take you through is that uh, the banking sector was well capitalized. Leverage was relatively low so that this, the system was able to absorb it. Okay. Um, 
So that's that's how I think about the illiquidity shock. It's not a real shock. It's not like a, a Barrow style consumption disaster. It's really a financial disaster that might turn into an endogenous um, output disaster. The, uh, and this is the, the next thing, and this is sort of important for thinking about the belief mechanism. I talked to you about uh, the crisis shock and then the run-up. And it's, it's, uh, this is really gonna stem from the falling assumption, which is that the illiquidity state is hidden. And what I mean by that is agents don't know um, how likely one of these bank run shocks is. Lambda tilde, I'll, I'll say more about that in the next two slides. Agents don't know that. They're gonna find out at some point, whoops, illiquidity is much more worrisome than others uh, than we thought. And if that's the case, you might end up in a, a financial crisis. As I said, that's very much in the spirit of this Dan Gorton Holmstrom uh, paper or the uh, Gorton Ordonez paper, which thinks of financial crises as opacity events. During normal times, there's things happening in the financial sector that you don't know about. You're sort of tested in one of these bank run events. And then you find out, oh, there's more problems floating around. If you find out there's more problems floating around, then you, you potentially get yourself into a full-blown cr crisis. That's the way I'm gonna think about the liquidity state. Um, let me, yeah, actually, let me uh, pause and take some questions. Yeah, Roy? Uh, yes, so um, in terms of the illiquidity discount, could you generate that within the model by having a convex um, adjustment cost of capital for the bank? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep, Kaushik. Yeah, so Arvin, the difference between uh, 2020 COVID crisis and financial crisis is the reaction which uh, central bank has given right so uh, uh, in the financial crisis there was uh, almost uh, not much of reaction within a month or two of the crisis hitting but in covid crisis central bank came out with huge liquidity right so how you distinguish this illiquidity state between these two crises right so opacity is probably still there in covid crisis but uh, yeah. liquidity is very different, right? Yeah, so I think you want to think about, this is a model with, with the model I'm going to take you through has no central bank. So everything here is uh, just the private sector. And of course, in the world, a crisis is both a result of vulnerability in the financial sector and the amount of firepower that a central bank brings to bear, right? And in a way, you can, the, the fragility of the economy is, increasing in in financial sector fragility and, and decreasing in firepower of the central bank and a model like this doesn't allow you to distinguish so that the shock is if you want a sort of a compendium of both of those together yeah. uh, the way this model will think about the shock is that in both 2008 and 2020 there's a shock in 2008 the shock is is hitting a financial sector that's uh, in such dire straits that for a fixed amount of firepower of the central bank, you still get yourself in a crisis. In 2020, for the same firepower, the shock has a smaller effect because the financial sector is in better shape. I think what Kaushik, you're pointing out is potentially there's also a difference in the amount of firepower that's at bear uh, in 2008 versus 2020. And that's a kind of a reasonable way to think about the world as well. I would push back a little bit though, Kaushik, in, in your characterization of more firepower in 2020 than 2008. There was an enormous amount of firepower brought to bear in 2008 as well. Even if it was a month late, it, it, in some sense, it sort of doesn't matter because we still, even after the firepower was, was brought to bear, we still continue to have a tail for probably until 2010, 2011, before we came back or think about the European sovereign debt crisis. And again, lots of firepower is brought to bear, but we still, end up with a big macro impact. So uh, my take on the world is that there was lots of firepower in there, but I think the meta point you're making is that this model is sort of thinking about financial sector fragility plus firepower of the central bank as a as sort of a joint event, not as two separate states. Um, and of course it is interesting to model those both separately, but uh, that is not what we've done here. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yep, Claudia. Thank you. Just a quick question. So, if I understood correctly, and please uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, you're talking earlier about the amplification mechanism, right? So, basically, this uh, this leads to the liquid spiral. So, should I understand and following the, the previous uh, question? So, should I understand that these liquid spirals were um, less obvious during the the most recent uh, crisis? Um, that's that's what uh, question that I have in mind. And also, should I also understand that? So I'm trying to link to um, to the moral hazard penalty. Is this lower during the, the COVID crisis? So maybe I'm yes. missing something here. But mm -hmm. so I, I think the thing I want to highlight here is that the kind of liquidity spiral that we saw in March, I don't think in and of itself had a big real impact. When I say real impact, I mean impacts on output and consumption spending and things like that, where in 2008, it clearly did. That's that's the distinction I want to draw. It looked like there was a financial disruption in both cases, but one which had fairly contained consequences in 2020 and not wide consequences as they did in 2008. That's really the point I want to make. Now, the second uh, uh, comment you made is about moral hazard. And you can already see this model I've written down is not one in which um, I have any variation in moral hazard. In fact, the only thing that's going to be moving around is W, the wealth of the of the financial sector, uh, sort of capitalization of the financial sector. That's the only thing that's going to be moving around. Um, why? Not because I don't think those agency frictions that I highlighted earlier are important. Mostly because, from a modeling standpoint, this is the, the sort of a, the simplest model to play with in order to get me to match the macro facts that I'm after. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I've highlighted this this illiquidity shock, uh, this potential bank run. And let me just, uh, uh, it's going to play a role, particularly in thinking about the likelihood of a crisis. So let me just take you through uh, one equation for this model. And that's the, mo the most important equation, if you want to, of this model is the banker's optimization problem. The banker's making the active decision of how many, how much capital to buy how much borrowing to take, so how much leverage to take. How is he taking this decision? Well, it's, it's a log utility banker, so it's kind of the usual stuff. That's consumption, log utility. And then with log utility, you know, the portfolio choice problem ends up basically being a mean variance problem where you're maximizing um, expected return on wealth minus uh, penalty for variance. So it's just the usual mean variance thing. Um, and a component of the variance is going to be how the wealth of the banker behaves if there's a bank run. So that's what I've highlighted here in yellow. This is the losses to the banker if one of these bank run shocks hits. And I'll just show you a couple of pieces to this. Um, that's the amount of leverage. XD is my variable for the amount of debt that the banker has taken. Uh, if one of these bank run shocks hits, remember the bankers are going to have to sell capital in order to cover their debt, and they're going to take losses, this, this uh, illiquidity cost that I've put into the model, which is proportional to alpha naught. Right? So that's the sort of losses that they're going to suffer. So their willingness to take leverage is going to be tempered by their worry that there's going to be a bank run. If a bank run happens, they're going to take some losses. So that's one component of the losses. The other component of the losses is endogenous. Kappa P minus is the price decline that'll happen if many banks are hit by these bank run shocks and there's a big sale of assets. It'll be the case then endogenously, the price of capital will decline. And so you're gonna take a, a loss on your capital holdings as well if one of these bank run shocks hits. So both together are a risk factor for the banker in taking leverage. So the banker is actively going to decide how much risk they're going to take, how much leverage they're going to be willing to take as a function of the cost of these bank runs, as well as their assessment of the likelihood of one of these bank run shocks, which is how likely these DMT th things happens. Okay, And that's what I'm going to show you in the next uh, two slides. So this is the leverage decision of the banker, how much leverage the banker is willing to take as a function of their own assessment of how likely these liquidity shocks are. If they think liquidity shocks are unlikely, so to the left here, they're going to lever up a lot. If they think liquidity shocks are very likely, 
they're going to say, I don't want to really take on too much leverage because the likelihood of a bank run is very high. So I'll hold a low level of leverage and that gets you to a kind of a, a, a lower level leverage. So keep this equation in mind as well for understanding some of the pre-crisis behavior. All right, so this is the last uh, piece of the model. It's um, how to model the banker's assessments of the likelihood of these bank run shocks. So what we're gonna assume is that uh, the world is in one of two states. It's either in a state in which these illiquidity shocks are likely or in a state in which they're unlikely. So lambda H, lambda L, we're gonna parameterize lambda L to zero, but that's not gonna be super important for this model. So you're either in lambda H or lambda L. Whether you're in lambda H or lambda L is unknown. So the agents in this world don't know whether you're in H or L. This is a continuous time Markov process with switching rates. Uh, these are the switching rates. Agents don't know which state we're in, but they can observe realizations of the bank runs. And uh, they're going to update their view of whether you're in state H or state L based upon realizations of these DNT shocks. Right? So if you just think about this, this is a very simple filtering problem. You don't know whether you're in state H or, H or L. You're figuring out whether you're in state or HL depending upon how often one of these DN shocks show us, shows up. Track the blue line here. Suppose you haven't had one of these DN shocks for a long time. You're gonna think to yourself, you're more likely to be in this Lambda L state, in which case your expectation of the intensity of these bank run shocks is, I don't think it's very likely. So you're, you're gonna be tracking at some low level. Imagine at day two that one of these shocks hits. You're immediately gonna update and think to yourself, oh, there's a chance that I'm actually in this H state. So your assessment of the state is gonna jump up to being in this Lambda H state. And you're gonna think, oh, liquidity shocks are much more likely to occur up here. And then over time, if, these if one of these shocks doesn't happen, the natural switching of the Markov process is gonna then lead you back to thinking to yourself, I'm back in the low state, right? So that's this blue line here. The purple line is one in which you're not learning at all. This is a world in which the, I'm, I'm gonna show you this through the lens of the model. Suppose the illiquidity shock is possible, but the likelihood of the illiquidity shock is constant, known, and not time varying, right? Just it's a static belief model. Illiquidity shocks can happen, but the likelihood of them is not time varying and agents are not really learning about it. It's not a particularly interesting model, but it's just one I wanna put up as a benchmark. And then the last line I wanna show you is this red line. It's a, it's a model in which agents are over extrapolating. Uh, if they haven't seen a shock in a while, they think the world is really good. So they put the world at this red line when a Bayesian would put the world at the blue line. One of these shocks happens, they over extrapolate and think, oh, the shock is much more likely to happen and will continue to be likely to happen. And so they jump up to the red line and then it takes them a while to come down. Okay. Um, I, uh, an attractive feature of the diagnostic belief model is it makes people over optimistic during, the, during sort of a pre-shock period and makes them overreact to a shock, right? And to the extent that some of the evidence is that it looks like there's a, there's a lot of froth in financial markets pre-crisis that seems, like, uh, seems attractive. And to the extent that markets react strongly when one of these shock hits, this also seems attractive. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, okay, so let me kind of talk you through the, the mechanism of this model. And from the first part of this talk, I think all, most of this should be kind of clear, but let me just talk you through this. So the key state variable here uh, that I'm graphing here is the banker's wealth share W, okay? If the banker's wealth share is high, if the bankers have lots of wealth, they can intermediate all the assets in this world, direct them all towards high productivity investments. So that output is gonna look like A upper bar times K. Right? K is capital, A upper bar is productivity if the bankers are controlling uh, investments into capital. There's a certain point here at which the banker's wealth share is low enough that the bankers are unable to intermediate all the capital in the world. The households have to hold some capital directly. If households hold capital, it generates output at rate A lower bar. And as banker wealth share moves further to the left, more and more households are holding the capital, in which case output is A lower bar. 
Um, so this part is sort of obvious um, as how bankers intermediate more and more of the capital of the economy output is higher. After a certain point, it's flat, right? There's an asymmetry here that uh, you should note. That's output. The price of capital is gonna be very closely related to output because output is basically kind of the dividend on capital. So the price of capital is gonna be very closely related to output. So you wanna think of the price of capital as, as uh, inheriting the shape of the output uh, function that I showed you before. And so take that and now imagine that one of these illiquidity shocks hits, right? <clears throat> Suppose you're in a currently in a state in which banker wealth is high and one of these illiquidity shocks hits. Uh, bank equity declines. The bankers take this loss alpha naught on the amount of debt that they have outstanding. But notice if banker wealth is currently very high, the price of capital won't decline. So that there's no fire sale impact of the bank run. Likewise, there's not going to be any impact on output because banker wealth share is still high. Output is still sitting at AL upper bar. So this is what I mean by an event in which there's, there's a kind of a financial disruption, but with limited real impact. That's a case in which banker wealth share is high. Take that same shock and put it in a state in which we're much closer to the kink point. And now you get this amplification mechanism to kick in. Uh, you, the bankers sell some capital, uh, but because wealth is low, the price of capital declines on the sale. That leads to an even further drop in uh, wealth of the bankers and potentially puts you down to kind of a lower point on the wealth distribution. And you can see that, that the intensity of the amplification mechanism in effect depends upon how far to the left you are. Um, uh, in the state space here with respect to banker wealth. So asymmetry comes out naturally. It's very related to the model that I took you through earlier. All right, so that's basically the model. The next thing I'm gonna show you is I'm just gonna take this model and run you through the data and then talk about how well the model does with respect to data. Um, again, I'm just gonna pause and see if there's any questions on the model as I've laid out. Very good, okay, so here's the, the model. Um, there's uh, three state variables that uh, describe the equilibrium. One is banker wealth share. That just follows intuitively from what I've just talked about. The second is the expected intensity of the illiquidity shock. And remember that's moving around over time, depending upon realizations of the, of the illiquidity shock. So Lambda is the expected intensity and uh, we're going to be playing with three versions of the model, one in which lambda is constant, one in which lambda moves the way a Bayesian would move it along that blue line that I showed you before, or one in which lambda moves the way a agent who extrapolates, uh, sort of overreacts to current information uh, will behave, which looks like that purple line that I showed you before. Okay. Uh, K is the scale of the economy. It turns out that in this class of models, you can eliminate this variable because it just scales everything. So really, this is a two-state variable model that we have to solve. Uh, there's a bunch of endogenous outcomes, uh, which we're gonna keep track of. One is the one is output. Output is very simple. It's just AK, and it's just a function of A upper bar or A lower bar, which determines output. The value of capital, which is a function of the state variables, W and Lambda. Bank credit, which is the amount of capital held by banks in, the, in this is how I'm gonna define it in the model. There's a credit spread, which we have to define. Uh, the reason we're defining a credit spread is um, I'm gonna match the pattern uh, that I showed you before that credit spreads are low before a crisis. So we're gonna define a credit spread in the model. Uh, the most important thing about this credit spread is it's priced by the banker's SDF. So I'm gonna price a, a corporate bond that the banker's SDF holds. Uh, and I don't have a picture to show you this, but the credit spread is gonna be very related to the effectively the sharp ratio on the banker's SDF, right? So this is, an intermediated banking asset, uh, and I'll price that. Um, and that, that will measure something like a, a risk premium that the banker is, uh, is charging on provision of credit, okay? Uh, and again, the fact is that that thing looks low in the pre-crisis period. Uh, I'm gonna define a financial crisis as a period in, I'm gonna simulate the economy and define a crisis as a period when bank credit to GDP is in the, is in the worst fourth 
percent quantile. Why four percent? Because the historical frequency of financial crisis is about four percent. So this will get me a financial crisis in a model that happens with probability four percent. Um, it's very important to note here. A financial crisis is not the same as one of these DNT shocks. These DNT shocks can, can come and go in the model. Whether or not they lead to a financial crisis depends upon the endogenous objects, in particular leverage of the, of the financial sector. Um, and I'm going to define a crisis as a situation in one of these, these shocks hits, leverage is high enough that credit has to fall into the lowest 4% quantile. That's how I'm going to define a financial crisis. Okay. Uh, and again, I'll remind you of that equation uh, that I showed you before. The probability of a crisis here in the model is going to be essentially related to leverage times the likelihood of one of these shocks hitting. Uh, so I'll take you through uh, the financial amplification mechanism of the model, and then coupled with three versions of this belief mechanism. One is one in which beliefs are not moving, not particularly interesting, as you'll see, uh, but useful to just um, highlight mechanisms of the model and one which beliefs move the way a Bayesian would move it and one in which beliefs over exaggerate the way a diagnostic agent would uh, uh, would do things and uh, we're going to uh, basically uh, calibrate this model and the calibration is going to basically a kind of a mi mix of some parameters that are going to be externally calibrated and some parameters that are going to be used to match um, targets from the crisis data I showed you before, things like the average output decline, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to evaluate the model on the cross-section. So when I mean by cross-section, in the model, we'll simulate the model and we're going to generate smaller and bigger crises. And so there's going to be some cross-section of financial crises. In the data, there's also a cross-section. And so in the what I'm going to do is assess how well the model does in matching the cross-section. Uh, just show you one slide on the calibration, just to give you a sense as to the important uh, targets of the model uh, and how that maps into the data. So Shalarik and Taylor tell us that on average, the three-year output drop in a financial crisis is 9%. That is going to be used to calibrate the gap between A upper bar and A lower bar. Remember, A upper bar is productivity of capital if bankers are directing capital. A lower bar is productivity if households are directing capital, what is going to happen in a financial crisis is basically the financial sector is going to be disintermediated. In disintermediating effectively, capital is going to go from generating output A upper, upper bar to generating output at A lower bar. So this gap is going to be very closely related to how big output wise a financial crisis can be. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to use the average three year drop to to parameterize the gap between A upper bar and lower, lower bar. In fact, as I'll show you, we'll hit that exactly. We'll hit the average drop perfectly because we have a, we have, uh, a degree of freedom to match it perfectly. What we're gonna be interested in doing in evaluating the model is there's gonna be variation within crises and we'll ask how that variation looks like. Um, bank leverage, if you've understood the model is gonna be quite important. Um, because the vulnerability of the financial sector to one of these DNT shocks is a function of how levered the sector is. And we're going to meet, match a mean leverage of five uh, in this model. Uh, that leverage is going to move around over time. There's going to be times in which the leverage is high and times in which it's low, which will indicate time varying vulnerability of the crisis. But the mean leverage we're just going to use to match uh, at five. The second set of things have to do with these illiquidity shocks. We need a frequency of the illiquidity events. Um, we're going to match it to once every seven and a half years. Uh, I don't have an answer for exactly why seven and a half years is yet. Um, I'll hopefully have an answer shortly. Uh, and then we need transition probabilities for um, these, these lambda shocks. How likely you are to jump from a low state to a high state. How likely you are in every instant to come back down to the low state. And we'll use the behavior of credit spreads, how quickly, how high they jump in a crisis, how fast they take to recover after a crisis to um, discipline those parameters. And then, I, as I said, I'm going to also, I'm going to play with a Bayesian model as well as an over-extrapolative model. And the diagnostic parameter in the over extrapolative model is exactly from um, Bertolo, Jenna Eoli, and Schleifer, who are the ones who've been pushing this, general, this diagnostic model. Uh, and we'll just use their parameter. 
Okay, so this is simulating the model um, around an event which is endogenously defined as a financial crisis. The, what is the event? The event is some set of shocks puts you in the four, worst 4% 4 quantile of the credit to GDP distribution. So credit to GDP falls into the lowest 4% quantile, we'll call that a crisis. So define those events as crises, and then let's uh, plot uh, in the model, the credit spread, credit to GDP, as well as output. Okay, I'll start on the right-hand side. This is output. Output falls by about 9%, 10%. Um, this is a mean path. We're actually, this is one of the calibration targets of the model. A upper bar minus A lower bar is going to discipline this output fall. So this is just a statement that, yeah, a model like this is well suited to getting you a big fall in output. No surprise, it's what it should do. This is the behavior of credit uh, around this crisis. So you get the big contraction that puts you in the lowest 4% quantile. And then it takes uh, several years to uh, recover as you go through the um, uh, beyond this. There is a slow recovery path in output as well as credit. Credit comes back a little faster than output. Um, output in the data looks like this, but it's actually, it takes longer. So we don't, we, we get a slow recovery, not quite as slow as in the data. Um, so one could add some more uh, sort of sand to slow this down, but um, we get a big decline in output and a somewhat slow recovery. Here's credit spreads. Credit spreads spike in a crisis and then take a while to come back down. In both the Bayesian as well as the diagnostic model, pre-crisis credit spreads are below average. That's this, this, uh, this line. And I wanna spend some more time explaining that. In the static belief model in which beliefs aren't changing, credit spreads don't look like they do what they do in the data. So um, one of the lessons of this model is that the static belief model is useless. It's sort of not a good model to describe the data. Okay. Um, the rest of my, yep, sorry. I wonder what credit spread is in the model. Oh, sorry. I, 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 in the model, I'm going to define an asset. Okay, it's a zero net supply asset that looks like a spread between a triple A and a triple B bond. And the key feature of that asset is it's priced by the bankers. Is it different from capital here? It's, a, it's, as I said, it's a zero net supply asset. It's a derivative asset in this model. It's not changing the equilibrium. It's, uh, for us, this asset is a measure of the, uh, of the SDF of the banker, right? But formally, what this asset is, is uh, think of an asset that has the payoff stream of a AAA bond, okay? okay. And has the exposure to aggregate risk uh, of a AAA bond, price that asset in this model. Who prices it? Price it via the banker's SDF. We can, we can price a bond like that. We can similarly price a triple B bond and we can define the difference in those prices, a credit spread, and that's what I'm plotting here. I see, thanks. Okay. Um, I do wanna make clear here, this is not, you know, there's capital in this model, um, uh, bankers default, this is not the price of default of the banker's debt. In fact, debt in this model is, is riskless because it's overnight debt. Uh, this is a separately priced corporate bond. Uh, it's, I, I, the way you should think about this is this is a, a way of assessing um, a risk price set by the banker's SDF. That's really what is designed to do this. So, you know, in the data, we see things like uh, credit spreads move very closely with uh, lending standards of, uh, of the banking sector. For example, there's this well-known paper by Gilchrist and Zakrashek that brought this GZ spread. It's a kind of excess bond premium uh, pulled out of uh, credit markets that moves very closely with the senior loan officer surveys um, uh, lending standards of in the US financial sector. So as a fact, um, lending standards and credit spreads are closely related. That's sort of the fact that we want to match in the data. We want, we're thinking of credit spreads as a way of assessing the banker's uh, risk bearing capacity, the banker's SDF. Um, in the data, we can measure credit spreads. We can't really measure a loan officer survey in the historical data, but we can measure credit spreads, but uh, we want to use it to assess the banker's willingness to extend credit and therefore take uh, risk as, a, as 
as a diagnostic for the model. So that's kind of what we're using credit spread for. All right, so I just showed you mean paths. Uh, let me dig in a little bit and show you cross section. This is the cross section of output growth around a crisis, which as I said, is left skewed. Here is the same distribution in the static belief model. Um, and you can see it also gets you a left skewed distribution. Actually, all of the models will get you a left skewed distribution. Why? It's because of the endogenous amplification mechanism. The underlying shock process in this model um, should get you uh, a normal distribution, but the con conjunction of the shocks and leverage gets you left skew. Why? Because of the amplification mechanism in the model. In bad states, if leverage is high, a shock hits, you're potentially going to get a, a big tail event. And so if you want a left skew is sort of an innate nature of an amplification mechanism, and it comes out fairly naturally out of this model. Right. So I'm going to view this as success. It's a sort of a success really of all three models. It's just a statement that the amplification mechanism, the model, the nonlinearity of the model naturally gets you a left skewed output distribution that is in line with the data. Um, I highlighted um, when I went through the facts that one of the things that happen that you can see in the data is that if you enter a crisis with a high level of bank credit to GDP, if there's been a big run up in bank credit so that the financial sector is levered, if you hit a crisis, the crisis will be more severe. So you can discriminate among crises depending upon the run up in bank credit pre crisis. That in the data is a regression of the output drop in a crisis on pre-crisis bank credit runup. This is the same uh, regression within the simulated model. Again, in all three models, you get that pattern. It's not quite as, it's the, the magnitudes are not um, exactly the data, but we haven't targeted the data explicitly. We've only targeted the means and we've just let the model tell us how well you do. Um, the one thing I want to highlight is that even in a model in which beliefs are not moving, this model is capable of generating the left skew. And why? It's simply the amplification mechanism. A higher level of bank credit in the model will turn out to be very closely related to high levels of bank leverage. So if you're in a highly leveraged situation and you get an, uh, uh, one of these crisis shocks, it'll get you a bigger decline in output which is why even a model in which beliefs aren't doing anything will get you uh, a big decline in output, right? Um, so this is just a, st a statement that the financial amplification mechanism, the model can get you some of the relations that you see in the data, particularly between bank credit and output. Uh, the same is true with movements and credit spreads and output, you, you, get, you do fairly well in matching uh, the data. Uh, here's another uh, point that comes out of these, this model. So in the data, one of the things that's uh, clear is that episodes in which bank credit is running up is an episode in which uh, expected returns are low. So if, you're, if, you're, if you run regressions of left-hand side expected returns or realized returns, right-hand side uh, bank credit, you find that Higher levels of bank credit predict lower returns. Lower levels of bank credit predict higher returns. Right? So bank credit, if you want, looks like a variable that um, helps to explain variation in expected returns with a negative sign. In the data, this is from Baron Zhang, the data coefficient is minus 0.02. That same pattern is replicated in this model as well. And uh, I'll, I'll just talk about this, the static belief model in which there's no variation in beliefs, which, all, which generates this negative pattern. Why is it generating this negative pattern? Because bank credit in this model is a measure of how well uh, willingness of the, of the banking sector to take on leverage and hold capital. If, for example, W is high, uh, bankers are well capitalized, they're going to be willing to take on more capital and willing to take on more risk. They're not going to be very worried about bank run risk. In such a state, you would expect that both bank credit is high as well as risk premium are low. On the other hand, if you're in a world in which W is very low, bankers are gonna be much more worried about their bank run risks and risks in general. They're gonna hold less capital, risk premium endogenously going to be higher. So this is, this is a model in which just fluctuations in 
the risk appetite of the banking sector, which in the model are endogenously generated through W, movements in W will generate a negative relationship between expected returns and bank credit. It's also true in both models in which uh, beliefs are present. Uh, but I highlight this, the static belief thing because it's telling you that it isn't the case uh, that the pattern and the data that run-ups in bank credit are coinciding with low expected returns says anything about uh, beliefs. It's just a statement that uh, bank credit and expected returns line up because both measure fluctuations in bank risk appetite. Okay, and so if you want to, all are really driven by variation in credit supply. That's at the heart of it. Um, here is, I think, the first place in which you, you realize that the that a pure a model with just movements and credit supply driven by movements in W uh, will fail. And that is that in a model in which beliefs are not moving, credit spreads pre-crisis are going to be higher than average. Um, you need beliefs. In a, in a belief model, credit spreads will be below average in line with the data. And let me just spend a slide explaining uh, why that's the case, sort of why you need more than just an intermediation amplification mechanism to match the entire crisis cycle. So think about a world in which uh, the only thing that's driving vulnerability of the economy to a financial crisis is say W or bank leverage. In such a world, um, if bank leverage starts to rise, agents will think to themselves, oh, crises are more likely. But if crises are more likely, that'll mean that risk is higher which should mean that credit spreads are higher. That is, if you if W starts to run down, you're kind of more closer to the cliff of a financial crisis. Agents should demand in, in from an asset pricing standpoint, both a higher risk premium as well as high credit spreads. That's why a model with just a pure intermediation mechanism will generate a higher spread before a crisis. It's sort of, it's very natural. Um, agents are forward looking. If they think that you're closer to the cliff, you're closer to a rare disaster, uh, they'll price credit spreads to go up. That's not the pattern in the data. The pattern in the data is that uh, if you look before a crisis, it looks like spreads are too low. So how can you get that? The way you get that is by move, changing around agents' assessment of the likelihood of these illiquidity shocks. Okay. Um, in particular, if agents think that an illiquidity shock is less likely to happen, one of these bank run shocks is less likely to happen. What they'll do is they'll lever up. That's the intuition I talked about before. But if they lever up, then endogenously, if one of these liquidity shocks happens, you're going to end up with a big crisis. So if you condition on a financial crisis and look backwards in time, it will be the case that credit spreads are low. Right? It's, a, it's just the counterpart of it. If you condition a crisis and look backwards, in a model in which beliefs are time bearing, you'll find that it must have been the case that in the pre-crisis period, people thought that illiquidity shocks were unlikely, so they levered up. Well, they got unlucky, one of these shocks hits, and so you ended up with a crisis. So conditioning on a crisis and looking backwards, you'll see that spreads are very low. So that looks like kind of the frothy financial conditions. That's what happens in this model. And note, it happens even in a Bayesian model. It's uh, you don't need to have an extrapolative expectations model to generate low spreads before a crisis. It's just a natural outcome of variation and effectively the, the willingness of the banking sector to lever up. If they're, more, if they're less worried about liquidity shocks, they'll lever up. But then if one of these liquidity shocks hits, they'll get themselves in big trouble and the economy will have a downturn. The uh, diagnostic model gets you the same relationship, just steeper. Right. This is kind of the, the map between the intensity of liquidity shocks and leverage uh, in the diagnostic model, you just get more of it. Um, another feature of the data is that it looks like low credit spreads and high credit growth are precursors to crises. So if you, if you run a regression looking forward, um, it looks like when spreads are low and, and uh, credit growth is high, that event kind of predicts a crisis. That's a, a bit more puzzling. What I just showed you in this regression is if you condition on a crisis happening and look backwards, you find that credit spreads were low. That is, it turns out that 
uh, that crises are preceded by credit spreads. It, that doesn't necessarily mean that credits, low credit spreads predict crises, it could. Um, and there's some evidence that that is in fact the case. So how can that happen in this model? And, and if you want, the puzzling thing is a crisis happens if leverage is high and one of these illiquidity shocks happens. So the probability of a crisis is related to both leverage as well as lambda tilde. If in a pre-crisis period, lambda tilde is low, that suggests that holding leverage fixed, the probability of crisis should be falling. But what happens in the model is, is as lambda falls, if agents pre-crisis think, oh, these bank run shocks are less likely, they're gonna lever up. The probability of crisis is increasing in leverage and decreasing in lambda tilde. It's basically a race between two effects. And from this graph, you can see that as lambda tilde falls, leverage goes up. The probability of crisis is leverage times lambda tilde. So as lambda tilde goes down, leverage rises. And if leverage rises faster than the fall in lambda tilde, you're gonna get an increase in a crisis probability. That's exactly what happens in the calibrated model that I've just shown you. I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions. This is, if you want to, this is the most uh, kind of intriguing result uh, of this model. It's a model at which it tells you that agents think that a bank run shock is unlikely, so they lever up, but endogenously that means that a crisis is actually more likely because the increase in leverage rises faster than the decrease in the likelihood of the liquidity shock. Yeah, Kaushik. Yeah, so uh, Arvind, uh, COVID shock is more like exogenous shock, right? Mm -hmm. So how uh, you model this interaction between exogenous and endogenous shock? The financial crisis is endogenous shock, right? And uh, you are right, like you are modeling it correctly with the beliefs part. But then Lever how... Le le endogenous is leverage times lambda tilde. Lambda tilde the lambda tilde shock is exogenous. Leverage is an endogenous variable. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this is just uh, pictorially, basically what's happening in this model. This is the distribution of output growth the next period, conditioning on different levels of bank credit. Um, and basically what's happening is if you condition on high bank credit, you'll see that there's a, a mass here in a big decline in output growth. And that mass is exactly this pattern that I just showed you. If agents think that Lambda, that the bank run shocks are less likely they lever up, most of the time they're fine. Outward growth is, is uh, tight and centered, but sometimes one of these things will happen and it'll happen and so it, it pushes mass down into these low states, which are the financial crisis states. That happens in the Bayesian model. It doesn't happen in a model in which beliefs are static. This is the diagnostic model, which it also happens and it just happens more. Uh, but the, the intuition you wanna think about is that predicting a crisis is a race between two effects in both models, both the, a model in which beliefs are Bayesian as well as diagnostic, it'll be the case that leverage goes up and when crises, when agents think that risk is low in, in both models and that'll uh, generate higher mass in tail states of output growth. Um, let me take you through one last thing um, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, one of the reasons to write down kind of a macro model of a financial crisis is to think about policy experiments. I think to me, it's the kind of most interesting reason to do this is to ask, once I have a model of a crisis, you can then run experiments like, what if you were to recapitalize the banking sector? How will that change the um, impact of shocks to the economy? Um, so that's what we're doing here. We're gonna do the following. We're gonna, uh, um, ask the following question. Suppose you were to take an initial state which looks like a boom, a state in which leverage is high and credit spreads are low, and you recapitalize the banking sector to give it more um, wealth, more capital. So redistribute some wealth from the household sector to the banking sector, which effectively increases the W of the banking sector and reduces the leverage of the banking sector. And then you throw in one of these bank run shocks What's the impact on the economy 
with the policy minus without the policy. So what's the marginal impact of the policy on the impulse of the economy to one of these, uh, uh, these bank run shocks? And that's what we're graphing here, right? Um, and let's look at the, this blue curve here. This is the path of output after one of these shocks. So it looks like output uh, rises. Keep in mind, it's the difference between with and without policy. So actually, in, if I was to graph the individual uh, impacts of the shock, it'll be the case that one of these shocks hits output falls. The thing, the reason this is going up is because if you recapitalize the banking sector, output doesn't fall as much. So this is the, if you want the, the benefit of recapitalization is, is that output doesn't fall as much. And so that's the gain in output relative to the decline that would have happened if you hadn't recapitalized. It's roughly 2% uh, two years out. Likewise, uh, credit spreads don't rise as much and bank credit doesn't fall as much, right? So you, you cushion the economy to a shock in this world if you were to recapitalize the banking sector before one of these bank run shocks happens. That's kind of what you should expect. Here's if you want the more interesting uh, result of the model. I can run the same experiment in two versions of the model, one in which the beliefs of the agents are uh, Bayesian and one in which the beliefs of the agents are diagnostic. So both the same model, I'm just tilting the reason for why agents, um, for how the, the underlying stochastic process of beliefs for the agents. And the result is that the, the, the benefits of policy are the same. The output response is very similar. So the gain on on cushioning the economy to an output decline is about the same, um, which is to say that from the standpoint of this model, if you're thinking about policy experiments of leaning against the wind during a boom, you sort of don't need to know what the underlying reason for why, say, credit spreads are low and leverage is high. What you need to do is look at credit spreads and leverage and then go out and, and choose to recapitalize. Um, the, the source of belief variation is not as important. Um, okay, so I'm just going to sort of pause and conclude if, unless there's any questions about what I've just taken you through. I can clearly sense that I've taken you through too much, um, but uh, hopefully this gives you some sense as to where I'm going. So let me just uh, summarize what I've taken you through. I've taken you through a, kind of a financial crisis model which with, with one particular feature of the intermediary asset pricing model, which is the amplification mechanism. And if you want one conclusion of this exercise I've taken you through is just a pure intermediary friction model gets a pretty good job of matching a crisis and its aftermath. Uh, it actually does a very poor job of matching the pre-crisis -pre run-up. And the reason is because a model with just a pure intermediation mechanism is a model in which, which will tell you that when leverage is high or bank capital is low, a crisis is more likely. And so credit spreads should rise or risk premium should be high, but that's not the pattern in the data. Uh, on the other hand, adding some variation in, in the banker's assessment of liquidity risks that moves around over time, actually uh, together does a pretty good job of parsimoniously explaining kind of all of the crisis cycle facts. So that's, um, if you want my kind of takeaway from uh, this exercise, a model with an intermediation mechanism and some variation beliefs are two pretty useful and essential ingredients, I would say, to matching the patterns around a financial crisis. Here's a second conclusion, um, which is nuanced and I think in a way uh, both more interesting and provocative. Um, variation in beliefs is really important in order to match the uh, patterns in crisis. Deciding whether you need to get belief variation via either extrapolative expectations or Bayesian, not so important. It's both versions of the model do a pretty good job. Um, and you could think of about micro models in which belief variation comes about purely for rational reasons. And uh, I've mentioned this before, these models of opacity like uh, Gorton Ordonez or Dan Gorton, they're sort of designed to get a situation in which uh, there's not much information and suddenly there's information and, and agents' beliefs change. That is a sensible model. You need a model like that to generate crisis. I'd say it's sort of an uh, 
one uh, lesson here is that's a super useful and essential ingredient uh, to getting a crisis. Now, uh, another version of a big shift in beliefs is via over extrapolative expectations. That's the line of research that these guys have been pushing that uh, uh, since in a crisis beliefs really move, it must be that they jump from sort of an, uh, an a pessimistic, sorry, an optimistic to a uh, pessimistic situation. And that's possible too, but both are possible. I don't think that uh, both versions kind of do a pretty good job. So if you dig in even further, some people would say, well, you know, in the data, one of the facts is that expected returns are, are negative in extreme credit growth episodes. And the only way you can deliver such a mechanism is if uh, agents' beliefs are uh, over-optimistic. That is, if in a pre-crisis period, agents are over-optimistic, maybe that'll predict expected returns. Um, I think my take on this is it's sort of icing versus cake. Um, the, the big fact of the data is there's a pattern in financial crisis of, of growth crisis aftermath. You can get, you need uh, an intermediation mechanism and belief variation to get you that data. If you really wanna uh, kind of get the icing, uh, maybe you need some more stuff about exactly how you pin down the belief variation, but the essential features are belief variation. And so if you put a lot of weight on say survey evidence or negative expected returns, you'll say, oh, in order to get this version of the icing, I need diagnostic expectations. But then, you know, there's other set of facts about opacity and debt and securitization that uh, Gary Gorton has pointed out, which you can get in a model in which you make no reference to extrapolated expectations. So uh, I think my takeaway from, from this exercise is you need beliefs and intermediation, and then everything else is just uh, quibbling over details. So that's mainly, these are the two things I wanted to, to talk you through. Um, I'm just gonna sort of step out of uh, where I've been and just talk about a kind of a general research agenda that this literature has been pursuing. Um, I guess from a finance side, we've been very interested in understanding how intermediaries matter for asset prices. There's ample evidence that's accumulated that intermediaries do. Um, I think some of the more interesting questions are in which markets, I think Mike pointed this paper by Harad Muir, which tries to sort between asset markets and say, in some markets, intermediaries matter more than in other markets. You kind of know that. You'd like to know in which states of the world they matter. You'd like to be able to quantify how much they matter. Uh, what are the real underlying frictions? I sort of wrote down a moral hazard friction. I could think of other frictions. Uh, which is the one that is most relevant? How do they vary across intermediaries? Certainly hedge funds, broker dealers, mutual funds, banks, they all face different frictions. So there must be variation on all this that must matter. And so from a finance angle, it's sort of, it's been very interesting. And I think it'll be continuing to be interesting to understand answers to these questions and how we can measure and quantify this. There's a parallel question, which is if uh, intermediation matters for the determination of asset prices, it almost follows uh, immediately that they'll matter for quantities, like the quantity of lending, which will then affect investment and spending and consumption. And so there's a set of parallel questions in macro, and that's the second thing that I took you through, um, which is how an intermediation mechanism is useful for thinking about uh, macro outcomes. Uh, and that naturally, I think, lends itself to a set of policy questions about macro prudential along the lines of the exercise I did do, crisis support policies, things we did talk about central banks did in a crisis, as well as broadly about financial architecture that I think are interesting from a macro standpoint. So I am going to stop there and thank you for staying with me for three hours. Any last minute questions? All right, thank you very much, Arvind, and thank you very much all the participants for joining us today. Uh, tomorrow we have another session on uh, global portfolio allocation. Thank you, Arvind. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Um, so regarding the fact, Regarding the the point that you made on the last slide, where what will how we can quantify the impact of intermediary friction in mm -hmm. asset pricing, yeah, I think the parameter 
Kappa, which I, which if I understand correctly, the governs mm -hmm. intermediate friction. Mm -hmm. uh, how we calibrate that parameter would be very important. Mm -hmm. And then yes. could you suggest what could be a good candidate for calibrating it or any other moment to target that parameter? Yeah, so I guess my take on where what's been most productive is to go is to get at lambda. Right, so uh, a kappa friction, I mean, a kappa friction will give rise to a, a binding uh, financial constraint. And the thing that is will matter most for the asset pricing equation for the intermediary is that lambda, the Lagrange multiplier on the financial constraint. Okay. Uh, um, so to me, what has seemed most fruitful is pursuing that angle, which is to discipline a uh, sort of an Euler equation for intermediary with a lambda that you can measure from some asset market data. Um, I think going from the ground up, which is, I, I, I think it's useful conceptually to start from the model from a ground up, that is start with the moral hazard friction and then build up. Um, I don't think it's so productive in taking that to the data because I don't know how to get at kappa. <laughs> right. um, I see. And in the end, there are many versions of the moral hazard friction that'll get you to the same uh, Euler equation. Um, that's just a conjecture, but I think there's many versions that'll get you to the same uh, intermediary Euler equation. So finding ways to get to the intermediary Euler equation is, is actually more productive. I see, thank you. Harvin, I have um, one um, side question. So um, I was thinking about uh, backing up the penalty for mismanagement. And I was thinking about um, comparing uh, financial stocks with non-financials. So uh, financial stocks are more opaque. Um, and I'm thinking that mismanagement would have lower penalty there. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, so I'm related, so, Think about relating this to um, to uh, doing the asset pricing test in the in the two um, sets of assets. Is that a good way to think about? Um, it's an interesting angle. Um, I I think off the top of my head I can't see it clearly. Like uh, Claudia, if the, if it, maybe the way to pursue this is to is to do that uh, exactly sort of. Write, write down the intermediary pricing condition in both of those models and see whether there's variation that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, th I think the tricky thing, and this relates to say the uh, Kelly Manala paper is what we often measure is the return on the outside investors wealth, right? That's kind of what HKM, measure the return on, on say a broker dealer portfolio right. and use that as a proxy for the SDF. Right. Right. And um, I, let me say it's a proxy for the SDF in, in, in a very particular cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't necessarily inform you of whether or not uh, a financial friction binds or doesn't bind. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you need to kind of play with the model to see more. And right. I, I, if you're going to go down this route, I would urge you to do it. I think there's enough there that you can probably figure this out for yourself. Right. So one thing that I had in mind is that, uh, well, some years ago, I looked at the comparison between uh, uh, financial and non-financial security. So you have the small firm anomaly in the mm -hmm. non-financials. And yeah. I don't know if things may have changed uh, recently, but for the financials, the effect was opposite. Mm -hmm. The expectation for big banks being larger than the small banks. And now I'm thinking, right. well, so smaller price, is that because big banks are more covered and mm -hmm. then the mismatch mm -hmm. cost is going to enter? Mm -hmm. So the price, uh, if you think about the price equation, you have the, the, mm -hmm. um, the penalty for moral hazard, right? So mm -hmm. that larger for larger banks because they are more covered, therefore smaller price, higher returns. Um, that's that's where I was going. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting angle. I I I can't see it off the top of my head, um, <laughs> but uh, I would urge you to just play with it and see if that's if I I this is interesting. Which is to say, I, I kind of like the idea of 
playing with this model and seeing how it matches to different types of data, doing different comparative statics and seeing whether you can identify. Anyway, that's the most fruitful way to approach this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Arvind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. All right. Yep. Thanks, Thanks for all your questions. Yeah. All right.